wait for we wait for a few more moments for the attendees to join. Good afternoon. I see the number of attendees increasing. We wait for a few seconds. Oh, here is David Chiaramonti. Good afternoon. Hi, David. Hi, David. We're live. We're live. We're starting uh, in uh, a minute or so. Okay, let's start. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maurizio Cocchi, and uh, on behalf of uh, UBC and Eta Florence, I would like to welcome you to this uh, side event, Innovations in Linear Cellulosic Biomass Value Chains for Advanced Biofuels. Uh, this is the final event of uh, a big cool project together with a uh, Brazilian project BioValue. Uh, we will talk about uh, development and deployment of uh, lignocellulosic cellulosic biomass mm, value chains for advanced biofuels uh, and uh, about uh, uh, international scientific cooperation. Uh, a few mm, housekeeping notes before we introduce the speakers. Uh, the, the, the event will be recorded. You can uh, intervene in the chat uh, through the platform, please not uh, through the chat of Zoom, but through the chat of the platform at any time. My colleague Emma uh, will look after the questions. Uh, everything will be available, including the slides after the, the event. Uh, I am co-chairing here together with uh, Andrea Monti, University of Bologna, Be Cool coordinator, which I would like to welcome. Andrea. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Good. Very happy to be here as well. <laughs> this Good. great public event. Very well, thank you. So we have uh, three sections in, the, in this event. Uh, one first uh, round of, uh, let's say, introductory uh, presentation to set the context uh, on policy and on global market overview and on uh, uh, a bit of overview of the two projects, uh, Be Cool and BioValue. And then we will go deep into the results and the activities of both of the projects we have uh, both uh, um, speakers from uh, uh, Europe and from Brazil, and then we will have a final panel discussion. So uh, there will be question time at the end of the of the event. Um, I think it's all. And with this, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Maria Giorgiadu from the European Commission DG RTD. She will introduce about the European Research Innovation Policy and International Cooperation Opportunities and the Mission Innovation. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maurizio. Good afternoon, uh, or good day, or um, <laughs> to everyone participating in this uh, conference. I had uh, the um, pleasure to introduce the RNI policy for this particular project, the Big Cool some years ago, and it is extremely interesting for, for, for me and I guess for everybody to see the uh, upcoming results of this, uh, this project. By saying these uh, few words, I would like to um, share my screen now and, um, and show you um, uh, what are the um, policies uh, in the European Commission uh, for the um, renewables uh, and uh, for the uh, international cooperation under the mission innovation. I hope you can see everything. Yes. Well, and this thing. Okay. And uh, uh, as Mauricio said, I work in the DG research and innovation responsible for the policies uh, in renewables and in particular renewable fuels, uh, advanced biofuels uh, and bioenergy. Uh, initially, the um, uh, overarching uh, policy uh, right now, framework policy for uh, this commission is the European Green Deal, which is actually 
the way to transform the European Union's economy for a sustainable future by intervening to all economic sectors, starting from the energy to the industry, to the um, mobility, uh, to the food system and to the bioeconomy, um, while uh, actually to, to buildings for, for energy efficiency, while respecting uh, the biodiversity, the uh, minimizing the, the, the pollution in the air for a toxic free environment, and uh, increasing uh, the ambitions uh, for uh, savings in greenhouse gas emissions. This is done through financing the transition with the various uh, financial is instruments that uh, the EU has in place, and uh, with a fair way to leave no one behind and to have a just transition. The underlying uh, climate and energy policies of this uh, Green Deal is, uh, uh, are the following. The European Climate Law, which uh, was launched yesterday and uh, is the one with 55% uh, at least net uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions reduction in 2030 and climate neutrality for the EU in 2050. The uh, EU strategy for an energy system integration, which uh, was uh, actually um, announced before and uh, has a, a focus on renewables, on uh, sustainable biomass, biofuels, green hydrogen and synthetic fuels. The hydrogen strategy at the same time focusing in the production, distribution and use of hydrogen uh, in the EU uh, and also um, with references to synthetic fuels derived from hydrogen. Also the biodiversity strategy uh, for restoring forest, soils, wetlands, green spaces uh, in cities, and the sustainable and smart mobility strategy for zero emission vehicles and automatic uh, mobility. To deliver in the European Green Deal, we have uh, the so-called Fit for 55 commitment, which is a set of legislative proposals that either have been amended or there are new proposals, and they are trying to reform the climate, the energy, the transport, the taxation and trade uh, areas. And most of these proposals are relevant for the renewable fuels, uh, biofuels and uh, bioenergy. But uh, here I will present you some uh, that are the most relevant, like the revision of the renewable energy directive, which now has specific targets for advanced biofuels and biogas in 2030, 2.2% and renewable fuels of non-biological origin, which are hydrogen and hydrogen-derived fuels at 2.6% in 2030. Uh, also, the reduction of the greenhouse gas intensity by 13% uh, at least in 2030 for all renewable fuels and renewable electricity, which is applied to transport. This is quite a high, uh, high target uh, for reduction, and it will require a, amounts of uh, renewable fuels. Other uh, regulations that uh, have been amended or are new and uh, they target uh, the greenhouse gas uh, emission savings are the effort sharing regulation with a new target of 40%, the emissions uh, trading system directive with a new target of, for uh, 2030, 61%, and expansion to maritime aviation and from 2026 to buildings and road transport. The LULUCF, the revision of land use, uh, land change, and forestry regulation, with an increased target for the sink uh, for greenhouse gas removals from the, the land, uh, which is 310 million tons CO2 equivalent from 2026 to 2030. Uh, the new proposals on aviation and maritime, the EU, EU, uh, uh, the fuel EU and the fuel EU aviation and maritime, with the particular targets for sustainable aviation fuels in 2030 and 2050, you see the increase of 5% to 63% uh, from 2030 to 2050 for these fuels in aviation. And for the maritime with a target of reducing uh, the greenhouse uh, gas content of the energy supplied to ships uh, by 6% in 2030, 75% in 2050. And this energy should be made by biofuels, biogas, renewable fuels of non-biological origin and recycled carbon fuels, and the revision of the energy taxation directive for that uh, foresees uh, exemptions for renewable electricity, renewable fuels, advanced biofuels, uh, bioliquids, biogas, biomass fuels used uh, in motors, used in uh, ships aviation, but also for heating. 
Um, there is also the winter package at uh, the, the December of 2021 that focuses on the gas market, but semi is uh, basically for biomethane and uh, hydrogen. On top of this uh, uh, energy and climate uh, policy, we have the Repower EU because of the situation uh, lately with the energy crisis. And uh, this is a joint uh, European action for more affordable, secure and sustainable energy. There was an announcement in uh, 8th of March uh, 2022, and there will be the communication uh, uh, announced on the 18th of May, uh, next week. And it, this is an action to increase the resilience of uh, the EU's energy system by controlling the energy prices, securing the gas storage and supplies, and reduce the dependency on the imports of fossil fuel by uh, many ways, uh, ramping up the production of uh, biomethane and hydrogen, decarbonizing the industry by uh, more renewables and increasing the renewable energy use. So in the uh, idea of speeding up renewables, uh, uh, it, it is the permitting, first of all, to roll out uh, renewable projects and uh, grid infrastructure improvements. On the use, it is to have more rooftop solar panels, heat pumps and energy savings that uh, will reduce uh, the uh, uh, energy needed, so the dependence on fossil fuels uh, and then um, making our buildings more energy efficient. Um, the diversification of gas supplies is to find new suppliers and secure the, uh, the gas and the storage of the gas for the next winter. On the biomethane, uh, the goal is to double the 2030 goal uh, in uh, uh, to 35 billion cubic meters per year production. So we need to increase the production of biomethane in, uh, in the EU substantially. Um, there is a hydrogen accelerator about infrastructure, storage facilities and, uh, and ports hubs of hydrogen in order to provide an addition uh, of 15 million tons renewable hydrogen, five from domestic and 10 million tons imported. And on the action on the decarbonizing the industry, it is uh, by ways of changing technology, switching to electrification and renewable hydrogen, or enhancing the uh, um, low carbon manufacturer capabilities and using also renewable fuels in industries. So the, we come now after this uh, uh, political context uh, to the research and innovation uh, context, uh, which is the Horizon Europe, the research and innovation framework program for these seven years of the EU, uh, which uh, you all are very well known, uh, know, and I'm not going to say much, of that, but the fact that energy uh, can be uh, um, addressed in all the pillars and all the programs uh, uh, from the defense to the uh, to the Euratom, but also the renewable energy under the, the three pillars. And we are uh, having a particular uh, policy under the pillar two global challenges and the European industrial competitiveness and under cluster five that uh, combines climate, energy and mobility activities. Now, if we uh, look uh, further into the policies uh, for the climate, energy and mobility cluster, and in particular for the area uh, with uh, sust destination, sustainable, secure and competitive energy supply, the policies aim to uh, have more efficient, clean, sustainable, secure and competitive energy supply uh, through uh, renewables uh, and through new smart uh, grids, and uh, we actually uh, support uh, to, uh, to foster the global leadership of uh, EU in affordable, secure, sustainable, renewable energy technologies, but also for uh, systems, grids and storage, for CCUs, carbon capture utilization and storage, and other areas. And in particular for the energy, uh, renewable energy technologies. Uh, these are technologies that can uh, provide opportunities to substitute uh, the carbon uh, from fossil origin in all the sectors, uh, the heating, the cooling, and the transportation in agriculture and industry, and in particular, the advanced renewable fuels being either synthetic uh, or sustainable and sustainable advanced biofuels. They are also necessary to provide long-term carbon neutral solutions for the transport and the energy intensive industrial sectors. And for this, the policies focus on having uh, in the long term, disruptive technologies available uh, and systems in 2050. 
and, uh, and continuously to reduce the cost and improve the efficiency, to de-risk the technologies uh, in order to exploit them commercially, to better integrate them in all energy consuming sectors, to reinforce the European scientific basis and the European export potential, to uh, look at sustainability, which must be enhanced in a complete value chain approach and to have more effective market uptaking solutions. With this in mind, under the work program 2022, 2021-2022, in this area, we have launched various topics in the renewable fuels, in the bioenergy and other actions, um, covering all the TRLs from low TRL up to the demonstration and market update topics. So a few of them are uh, for, for catalysis in the production of advanced biofuels, for um, uh, reusing uh, CO2 uh, emissions uh, from uh, biofuel production and uh, storage in products making thus uh, carbon negative biofuel production. Also in algae, in biomethane. Biomethane, uh, we uh, have uh, actually uh, put a topic with uh, 20 million of biomethane production. And I'm saying that because it's very relevant for the recovery EU. And uh, actually, we, we will support um, many more projects uh, in this. Um, also in uh, advanced biofuel production, in value chains for renewable, in international cooperation for scaling up uh, the sustainable biofuels. And I will show you the, the relevant topic. And uh, also for uh, other, for agriculture, for uh, energy carriers, and uh, for coupling solar fuels with other renewables and in artificial photosynthesis. And in bioenergy, we looked at uh, CHP in uh, reusing of the emissions at industrial level in uh, carriers for heating. And uh, in other actions, we have a study on uh, the industrial capacity of drop-in advanced biofuels and another on pre-commercial procurements for shipping uh, and aviation uh, advanced biofuels uh, development. The relevant topics uh, under Horizon uh, 20, uh, Horizon Europe, for 2022 are the renewable energy incorporation in agriculture and forestry, where uh, uh, you need to combine uh, the um, uh, regional value chains uh, from different renewables uh, in order to manage uh, the, the waste and the energy demand and the land management in agricultural forestry um, uh, needs. Uh, we have another one on demonstrating complete value chains for advanced biofuel and non-biological renewable fuel uh, production. Uh, here, all the challenges along the, the, biofuel, the advanced biofuel or the renewable fuel uh, value chain are uh, pertinent and eligible. And uh, one which is uh, particularly focusing on um, uh, international cooperation and in mission innovation, which is called best international practice for scaling up uh, sustainable biofuels. Uh, this uh, will be open this September and uh, the deadline is uh, next uh, January, 2023. And a few words in another way of collaborating is the EU Catalyst Partnership. This is a partnership between uh, the EU and uh, between uh, the um, uh, Breakthrough uh, uh, Catalyst uh, Program and supports four areas, hydrogen, sustainable aviation fuels, uh, direct air capsule and long duration energy storage. And actually uh, it's a partnership, each partner puts uh, an equal amount Totally, there is 1 billion uh, US, uh, forget the euros now, it is 1 billion US um, in uh, the total budget of uh, this, um, um, of this uh, partnership. And there should be a one to three leverage because uh, the partnership will provide up to 50% of the financing, the project need to raise another 50% and there is the, the leverage. So, uh, how to apply, this is in, a, in this uh, uh, slide uh, showing that we have a topic under the Horizon Other Actions, uh, uh, which is called Contribution to Invest EU Blending Operation and the, the Green Transition Product. So this is a, a, a product uh, that uh, supports the four areas that I said, but uh, it works with EIB loans and quasi equity or a combination. Uh, these are drawn from uh, this Horizon Europe Action, all the Innovation Fund, all the InvestEU uh, budget or end, and they are blended with non reversible components funded by this Horizon Europe Action. It is open to all applicants. 
And um, actually the commission does the eligibility screening and the uh, EIB checks for the financial viability and performs the full, uh, the full due uh, diligence. So in the second quarter right now, this, uh, this is uh, open. And finally on mission innovation, uh, phase two, this was launched on uh, the 2nd June, 2021. For the next decade, uh, it will support uh, investment in research, development, and demonstration for clean energy to make it affordable, attractive, and accessible, and to accelerate towards the Paris Agreement goals and uh, climate neutrality. Um, there are two ways uh, to collaborate. One is the innovation platform, which has three modules, the insights, the collaborate, and the accelerate. And under the collaborate, there is a a module on innovation for international sustainable aviation fuel. This is um, to force partnerships uh, for uh, sustainable and cost-effective strategies for sustainable aviation fuels. It is co-led by India and United States, and we participate uh, as EU together with China, Netherlands, and, uh, and Denmark. And the other way of um, uh, collaborating internationally, it is through the missions. The missions, um, they are focused uh, on, on results, uh, and these are high ambition alliances between countries, corporations, investors, and research uh, institutes. Under the missions uh, portfolio, together with uh, many others, there is the integrated biorefineries. Um, it is co-led by India, the Netherlands, and we participate together with Brazil, with Canada, and the United uh, Kingdom. Um, and uh, in particular, the launch of this uh, mission is very recent, uh, last month, uh, on 4th April 2022, and the goal is to develop and demonstrate innovative solutions to accelerate the commercialization of integrated biorefineries with a target to replace 10% of fossil-based fuels, chemicals, and materials with bio-based alternatives by 2030, quite ambitious goal. Um, so it, it, we, it will advance the sustainable biorefining pathways and technologies uh, to support the development and commercial, commercialization of uh, these uh, bio-based products. Uh, we will consider also energy process demands in uh, making uh, these uh, statements of 10% replacement. Um, and uh, uh, there are three areas uh, to promote research, uh, development, and innovation uh, across the biorefining supply and value chain to advance the demonstrations at pilot scale for these technologies and to collaborate with industry and the standard settings organizations in, to support regulatory uh, development and market uptake of, of these products, actually. Um, as I said, the colleagues are the Department of Biotechnology, Ministry of Science and Technology, Government of India, and the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy in Netherlands, and um, the, the, the participants, and we have also support by knowledge partners, uh, uh, like the IEA, the IEA Bioenergy Task 42, and others, and um, uh, the uh, Biofuture Initiative, the SEM, the Clean Energy Ministerial, the Renovable Institute, etc. Uh, I'm going to say that uh, in the next uh, programming 23-24, we will uh, we're thinking of uh, having a kind of action, a topic that will support uh, this uh, integrated biorefineries mission and in which uh, uh, cooperation with uh, mission innovation uh, will be uh, expected. So thank you very much for your attention. I will be happy to reply to any of your questions and um, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for this really detailed and comprehensive overview of the policy and of the many opportunities for continuous this cooperation. It was really um, stimulating and uh, uh, encouraging for, for the people working in Bikul and in BioValue. I was uh, trying to say that there are many co cooperation, international cooperation opportunities and the, the many new actions that we put forward in this uh, domain of research and innovation. Great, great. Thank you. Uh, so I encourage all the participants and the attendees that I see are increasing uh, to um, put the questions in the chat window in the panel and then we will take questions after the um, first round of presentations. With this, I would like to uh, introduce the next uh, uh, speaker 
that is no sorry <laughs> it's not is uh, we have uh, first an, an introduction on uh, um, i'm sorry Ilka, sorry just uh, we we will first introduce the two projects that collaborated be cool and biovalue so be cool was the the european project of horizon 2020 and be cool is the uh, counterpart the sister project in Brazil. So we will learn, we will have an overview of the two projects and the, uh, let's say, the lessons learned from the coordinators, uh, Andrea Monti from the University of Bologna from the cool side and Antonio Bonomi from Laboratorio Nacional de Biorenovaes in Brazil. So they will share the presentations. Uh, I ask my colleague uh, uh, Silvia to start with the first uh, presentation by Andrea Monti. Thank you. And Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mauricio. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, please, next, uh, uh, next slide. So I just introduced uh, very briefly the project uh, before uh, handing over to Antonio for the uh, BioValue project. Uh, Be Cool uh, started at uh, 1st June 2017, uh, involving, uh, as you can see in the map, uh, 12 uh, uh, European partners from uh, seven uh, uh, European countries. Please, next slide. Um, importantly is to say that uh, um, the Be Cool project uh, has been considered since the beginning for uh, uh, having a very strict cooperation with uh, BioValue, the project of, of Brazil. And uh, here is uh, just a complicated map, uh, but to show you that we thought that nearly all the activities in the Be Cool project and BioValue project uh, um, have been strictly um, related uh, and uh, we had cooperation near all the activities that took project. Please, uh, next. Um, the topic called asked to cover um, at least uh, one of these three uh, sub challenges. Uh, and we decided to, uh, in agreement with our uh, um, twin project in Brazil to cover all of these. Uh, so uh, the Be Cool project uh, is. Um, has been addressing uh, the gasification uh, uh, of biogas uh, in uh, thermochemical processes, the biomass production and new feedstocks and uh, logistic concepts uh, uh, and feedstock diversification, and also the um, biochemical approach and uh, fermentation, separation, uh, pretreatment, and so on. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, here again is a uh, really lack of beauty slide, but anyway, it's just to um, tell you how the project uh, was organized, more or less the same uh, of BioValue. Uh, we decided to have three uh, pillars. Um, um, the first is on the uh, agricultural uh, um, feedstock uh, and feedstock diversification, so to find new a solution in terms of feedstock, involving also the harvesting logistics. Uh, and uh, the second one is on the new logistic concepts. Um, and uh, then we had the third pillar on the processing. Uh, part of it was uh, dedicated to thermochemical uh, conversion, the gasification, pyrolysis, uh, and, uh, and the other one is on uh, biochemical um, biochemical conversion. It's important to, to say that uh, we had a very, um, well, part of the project was dedicated to have the, a strict cooperation even between the two, um, work package three and four with dedicated to thermochemical and biochemical conversion in order to uh, valorize uh, uh, all the um, co-products and the sub-products and, and the residues from the uh, processing, coming out from the processing. Then we have the other work packages, of course, uh, um, more horizontal uh, concerning the um, assessment, integrated assessment and dissemination. This is just to show you the um, picture of what uh, was uh, FISTO diversification trials. Uh, go, please, uh, next. This is on logistics. I don't want to spend time here because we will uh, illustrate all the 
outcomes, the main outcomes in the, uh, the presentation later on. Uh, I, again, I want to say you that uh, it's, for me, it's very important to say that our project was uh, um, really um, focused on the value chain. So we, uh, we uh, decided since the beginning of the project to work on the value chain all together using a simple language. Uh, uh, so in, uh, in, the, in the way to sharing, understanding as much as possible. Next, please. This is on thermochemical processing. Again, it will be uh, presented later on. And this is on biochemical conversion, okay. And finally, the integrated sustainability assessment uh, uh, on um, involving all the uh, different scenarios and value chain we consider. Next, please. I don't know if there are, okay, next, next. This is the same. We, of course, dedicated uh, also time, important time for dissemination. We had the opportunity to have two uh, some meetings in person uh, in the first part uh, of the project. Uh, here we had the kickoff meeting, uh, uh, the beautiful room, uh, room, uh, room here uh, with the participation of uh, Brazilian colleagues as well, and uh, another in a meeting uh, on the right side in Brazil. Then you can find all the information in the website with uh, some short uh, videos. Uh, interviews and many other material. Please, okay. That is all from my side. So I hand over to Antonio. Thank you. Uh, Silvia, can you share the other slides? Okay, so Antonio, the floor is yours. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Mauricio and Andrea. Uh, Okay, the BioValue project, we, we starting the BioValue project, we had three main uh, points. Uh, the first one was to look to the road chain decentralized, the decentralized biomass valorization and the production of, of advanced biofuels. So the goals would be the Brazilian European cooperation for development of, of advanced lignocellulosic biofuels. And the other important goal to do that was the collection of literature, lab, and pilot plant scale data for technical, economic, environmental, and social assessment of different biomass production systems and biorefinery configurations for advanced biofuels. Next slide, please. Next, please. Ah, thank you. Again, we have the three groups of some challenges that Andrea already talked about. The first one about the, uh, the process, the thermochemical process that we would look at in order to, to evaluate the different strategies for the biomass, uh, the advanced biofuels production from, bio, from biomass. Then the the, we look to the biomass production, the group B, the biomass production and the design of an assessment of optimal logistic chains. And finally, the third group about the biochemical process and energy efficiency in advanced biofuel production integration to, with thermochemical routes. We, we will give some more details uh, later on. Next, please. Okay, so the BioValue project was uh, financed, was supported by four state research foundations from four different states of Brazil, Sao Paulo, Minas Gerais, Pernambuco, and Rio Grande do Sul. For, uh, was supported also by four companies, Susana and Clabin for the pulp and paper industry, Embraer for the jet fuel production, and Petrobras from the Brazilian oil company. And, for, and, for, and finally, it was, it's, it's being executed because the BioValue project will still have one year, one year and a half, more or less, uh, to, to finish by 11 scientific institutions uh, comprising uh, universities and uh, technical institutes in Brazil. Next, please. 
So the, the integration of the technical value chains that we are looking uh, uh, are founded in four pillars. The first one is the production of the feedstock, looking to field uh, studies about agroforestry, sugarcane residues, dedicated crops to be used as biomass for the advanced biofuels production. Then we have the conversion and energy densification, looking to the possibility of decentralized units in order to produce the advanced biofuels. Then the upgrading of this uh, decentralized unit in, in very in large centralized unit, for example, if you consider uh, gasification and co-processing are clear examples of centralized units upgrading the bio oil produced in the, uh, for example, in the conversion and energy densification of the biomass. And finally, to look to the products, to the advanced liquid biofuels that we are producing with major focus on the biojet fuel production, but looking also to others, especially when you consider the biochemical process. Next slide, please. So the technical highlights of the BioValue project will be thermochemical and biochemical routes to convert biomass in advanced fuels, uh, logistics for feedstock available in Brazil. And so we are talking about residue from sugarcane, from forestry, from pulp and paper industry. That is only uh, as a side studies that we, 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 we possible consider in the project. And energy crops, the, in the case of conventional cane and energy cane to be used for the feedstock, uh, as feedstock in the BioValue project. Then the next uh, point will be the energy densification in fast pyrolysis and HTL decentralized units. And that is important if you consider that it's not possible to transport in long distance the biomass, so we have to transform it in, uh, in intermediate densified products. And uh, one also that is being considered is the pellet production from the sugarcane residues. The gasification of biomass and bio oils in, this, in centralized units, as we said before, upgrading of syngas and bio oils in centralized unity and here the co-processing is a very important uh, alternative or strategy that we are considering. The biochemical process and upgrading of biomass. And then the, the, the analysis that will be performed is technical, economic, environmental and social assessment of production chains. And that's important to, to point out here that some of the process that we are looking will be only analyzed through assessment. We are not doing some, uh, some experimental work on 18 lab and pilot plant, but some of them in all the cases, even for a decentralized and centralized process, we are looking also to the uh, lab and pilot plant uh, uh, development. And finally, the design and assessment of existing and potential logistic chains is another important point that is being studied in our project. Next, please. And then all these uh, studies are done always looking to a cooperation and with synergy with the BICU project. And I think Andrea has pointed out very well uh, this point in his presentation. And so some of the points that I would like to, to highlight are the comparison of different strategies for biomass production in Europe and Brazil. And that will be very important if we are really looking to solve the climate problem of the world. Logistic chains to deliver different biomass from field to conversion plants. Brazil and, and European technical approaches for gasification of biomass and intermediate energy carriers, including mainly pyrolysis and lignin-rich streams, the synthesis to advanced biofuels, 
Brazilian European technical approach for biochemical process and energy efficiency in advanced biofuels production. And to do that and to be sure that the, the, the results and the, the use data in the two projects can be compared, an important uh, point was the strategy between the cooperation of the two projects was harmonization of data and methods to be used in assessing the sustainability of different Brazilian European production chains. And to do that all, we had joint annual, annual European Brazilian, actually more uh, two, two annual uh, meetings in this last part. Of course, all this was with some problems due to the pandemic world situation. Next, please. Yeah, thank you. I think with that, I, I give you an idea and details of the project will be uh, pointed out and will be present my colleagues later on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea and Antonio, for these overviews of the two projects. So as uh, uh, you have understood the two, um, the, the, the pillars of the two projects were uh, synergistic and uh, uh, they cover the whole spectrum of the uh, value chain from the upstream activities to the downstream processing and uh, final assessments. In the next presentations uh, by the speakers, you will listen more in details to the results. But before we uh, move to the results of each activity, uh, it's good to spend some more words, uh, some more time on setting the context and understanding why this international cooperation uh, uh, is important that uh, the, the global market outlook and scenario where uh, the deployment of, of uh, lignocellulosic value chains at international level would fit in. And we, for this, uh, I would like to invite Ilka Anwa, uh, Senior Energy Analyst at the IEA, uh, to um, introduce us on the role of bioenergy and advanced biofuels uh, in the net zero emission scenario for 2050. Thank you, Ilka, for accepting our invitation and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Maurizio. And thank you for the uh, kind introduction. It's very, uh, I'm pleased to be able to join this PQL event and this kind of uh, project um, final seminar where kind of technology innovation and international cooperation are at the very heart of the project because those are also the things that underpin many of the um, uh, underpin the kind of net zero emissions type of scenarios. So um, thank you for this opportunity and I would like to spend this uh, a few minutes to just share some perspectives on, on bioenergy and net zero from, from the IEA. Um, I will start by, let's hope that I can switch, yes, uh, introducing some of our updated and new uh, scenarios, which we, the latest edition came with the World Energy Outlook 2021. So currently from this picture, you can see um, the, the four scenarios and the associated uh, emission trajectories. And on the very right-hand side of the figure, you can also see the associated temperature rise uh, by the end of century associated with these scenarios. So with the stated policy scenario, that includes all the climate and low carbon uh, policies that have already been implemented by, um, uh, by countries and then aggregated together to get a global view on the emissions uh, uh, trajectory. Then we have the announced pledges scenario which uh, takes the stated policies, but adds to that the, uh, all the pledges that have been made yet already, but have not yet been implemented. This includes especially the various uh, net zero emission pledges that we have been seeing uh, mounting during the last two years. The EU as a bloc has made a 2050 net zero pledge. The UK has a pledge for 2050. Uh, Japan has a 2050 net zero pledge, China 2060. And then in the COP26 in 3rd of November, we also heard that India made a 2070 net zero pledge. So this has now been uh, updated after the COP 
the announced pledges uh, to include the Indian net zero pledge of 2070. And additionally, the so-called methane pledge where 100 countries uh, promise to reduce fugitive methane emissions by 30% by 2030, which is quite important um, a pledge as well, given the how, how aggressive climate force uh, methane is. And um, like our executive director at that time, Fatih Pirol, already uh, pointed out, after these COP26 pledges, the world is for the first time has enough pledges uh, to for the um, temperature rise to be reduced be uh, below two degrees Celsius. So current pledges, according to our analysis, uh, point out to something 1.8 degrees of, of warming. Uh, but this is still very different from the net zero by 2050, which is consistent with the 1.5 um, uh, degrees warming. So uh, there is still a significant ambition gap uh, after the, all these net zero emission pledges to really be on track of reducing uh, temperature rise to 1.5, which is consistent of uh, achieving net zero uh, globally by 2050. So um, this is, of course, uh, a, a very long term target. And as a result, uh, the IEA published uh, one year ago on, in May, uh, a net zero emissions 2050 uh, roadmap with the express intent of taking this long term goal of being net zero in, uh, in decades from now and um, uh, breaking it down into smaller measurable milestones because it's not always uh, very easy to say, what should I do today? What should I do tomorrow as a policymaker that I would know that I would be on track with our long-term ambition of being net zero by 2050. So this roadmap includes almost 400 different milestones and policy measures that can be implemented so that uh, as a part of the journey of becoming net zero by 2050. It has sectoral approach. We can see that the electricity uh, sector emissions are the first to fully go to zero already by 2040. This is due to because most of the low carbon technologies that we have um, in the marketplace today actually are in, uh, can be used in um, electricity generation. And secondly, because a lot of the other uh, sectors are relying on relying on electricity to decarbonize. So then, for that reason, it's very important to get electricity um, uh, very low carbon, very low emission as quickly as possible. I have highlighted here uh, kind of one important target that we have in the scenario for biofuels, which is that already by 2040, uh, half of fuels used in aviation are sustainable. So each of these are. Um, a considerable feat and they're at their own taken all together a complete overhaul chains and revolution in the way we produce transport and use energy globally. Uh, the scenario is underpinned by kind of both deployment of existing technologies and then uh, unlocking the next generation of low carbon technologies through innovation and interestingly Looking at the CO2 savings by technology maturity between now and 2030, so end of this decade, we see that 80% of CO2 savings come from technologies that are already in the marketplace. So it involves implementing technologies like more wind, more solar, more bioenergy, for instance, more EVs. But then when we have a longer term view between now and 2050, we notice that half of emission reductions between now and mid-century come from technologies that are not in the marketplace today. So it's a great um, a task of this decade to unlock the next generation of technologies so that they are commercialized uh, by the end of this decade so that we can invest, invest in them and deploy them uh, at the growing uh, pace in the 30s and in the 40s. So it kind of we, we need both the deploying everything we have as, as quickly as we can, but let's not forget the need for, for innovation and uh, global uh, cre create greater international cooperation. Without both uh, the global CO2 will not fall to net zero by 2050.
So zooming into the role of bioenergy in the, in the scenario, we see that already from this figure that uh, bioenergy plays a major role in various forms. It rises uh, more than doubles from current uh, use, the modern bioenergy to 100 exajoules in 2050, when it meets almost 20% of total energy needs and becomes the second largest source of energy supply in this scenario. We, in our, according to our assessment, the global demand still of the 100 exajoule in 2050 is well below the assessed sustainable potential. Another important thing we see in this figure is the uh, use of traditional biomass, mostly for, for fuel wood, for cooking in, in emerging uh, and developing economies, that is fully phased out in the, in the scenario during this decade. It's a big demand uh, or a big amount of bioenergy use. Uh, it's polluting, it has severe health consequences. That's fully phased out in the scenario, replaced by cleaner cooking through pressure e-cookers and, and, and biofuels. Uh, as a method for cooking. Um, and the modern part increases and fairly um, and, and really goes to the all traditional energy sectors, electricity, heat, transport and, and industry. Uh, something that we see a need for an extremely uh, quick expansion is advanced biofuels which are a basic requirement for reaching net zero in the scenario. So advanced, especially the liquid biofuel production expands very rapidly over the next decade, growing from less than 1% of total biofuel supply in 2020 to almost 45 in 2030 and representing 90% in the mid century. Um, the expansion is seen both in the gaseous biofuels and in liquid biofuels. And if you look at the shaded part of the, um, of the uh, bars here, those are the kind of amount of uh, production that is uh, associated or connected with CCUS to capture, and, 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 and to capture carbon for either for utilization or, or for underground storage. And the underground storage is also a thing that uh, is uh, captured from a number of sectors and emission sources. Looking here, we see bioenergy contribution being mainly from electricity generation and from fuel supply and some on industry, where I also think there are quite interesting um, opportunities there. So this is needed because in the net zero emission scenario, even though you have massive uh, mitigation efforts, there are still some residual emissions coming in 2050, uh, from mainly from fugitive emissions and from agriculture. And to really to achieve net zero, this amount of about two gigatons of CO2 emissions annually need to be offset by removals. And in the net zero emission scenario, these removals are divided, the about two gigatons is divided fairly equally between bioenergy with carbon capture and storage and direct air capture and storage. Um, after having uh, looked at the kind of required acceleration of, of bioenergy in all its forms uh, to reach the goals. It's a sobering thing to, to take a snapshot of, of the current situation. Here I have kind of the historical expansion uh, and situation of biofuel, uh, global biofuel demand. Uh, biofuel demand has in the past grown about 5% per year on average, uh, but to really to, um, to be on track with the net zero emissions, a much higher average growth of 14% per year is needed um, to 2030. So significant policy actions are needed to accelerate biofuel demand and put biofuels on track with the scenario. So to conclude, um, this is a really a formidable and critical goal globally which requires an unprecedented transformation of, of our energy sector. Um, we, the, the, the reaching the goals hinges on both on immediately and massively deploying all available clean energy technologies as, and as well as boosting clean energy innovation to unlock the next generation of technologies. Um, <clears throat> low emission fuels play a very big role in the scenario, they come in various forms and technologies as liquid biofuels, biomethane, 
hydrogen and hydrogen-based fuels. And in the scenario, they mostly help to decarbonize sectors where direct electrification is challenging, like aviation, for instance. Uh, we, the net zero emissions energy mix in 2050 is dominated by renewables. And in this mix, sustainable bioenergy has a prominent role in flexible electricity generation. It provides high temperature heat for industry, fuels for transport. And increasingly, it's used in connection with carbon capture utilization and storage. Um, however, we need to put kind of bioenergy on track. Uh, urgent and strong policy actions are needed from governments, and we need much greater international cooperation so that we can attract more investment at scale and foster the required innovation. Some of the things that I think are very, resonate very well with the PECOL project as, as I understand it. All right, this was my last slide. Thank you for the attention and ready for some questions. Thank you, Ilka. Thank you very much. I think it was really useful to have this presentation, these two presentations now, not one to set the European policy context and the uh, global context for international cooperation, scientific cooperation, and one on this uh, outlook and scenarios uh, that clearly explain why we need uh, further re research uh, and innovation and uh, uh, why international cooperation is needed. I take two, two take-home messages. Uh, one, uh, uh, that we need half of the reductions in your scenario come from technologies that are still not in the market yet. So we need to continue uh, to push forward the uh, research innovation. And the other that uh, without greater international cooperation, uh, we won't manage to uh, to reach our, uh, the net zero uh, goals. Absolutely. Good. So with this uh, good overview of the, of the context, I think we are now uh, ready to present the results uh, and go deeper into the results. I invite again all the speakers, uh, all the attendees to put questions in the chat, either here in the Zoom platform or in the uh, virtual UBC platform. I don't see any for the moment. Uh, uh, so I think we, in the interest of time, we can move on. Uh, and uh, with this, I would like to include, uh, uh, introduce uh, uh, Mircini Cristo from the Center for Renewable Energy Sources in Greece. Uh, that will uh, talk about the results uh, on the feedstock diversification and increasing the resource efficiency with integrated cropping systems and improve harvesting logistics for advanced biofuels value chains. Mircini, before I give the floor to you, let me remind to all the speakers that many of the Be cool presentation, many of the Be cool results are also presented uh, in other uh, single presentations in the uh, conference program. And you can find them also uh, in the Mikul area, in the uh, EU project area. Sorry for this time. Mircini, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Maurizio. Uh, do you see my screen in full mode? Okay. Not okay. in full mode, but we can see it. Oh, I hope it will come because I have uh, uh, in, the, in the slideshow mode. I, I hope it will come. Anyway, it is uh, readable, okay? <laughs> huh? Go on, yes. Okay. So um, uh, again, good, uh, good morning or good evening to all the uh, participants of uh, this uh, meeting that we have organized. Uh, I really hope that uh, we would uh, have the chance to discuss uh, in physical all these uh, 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 results that we have uh, uh, got so far, but anyway, the screens are <laughs> the screens are doing their job. So um, uh, my name is Mircini Christou. I lead the biomass department in the uh, Center for Renewable Energy Sources and Saving, and uh, I was honored to lead uh, to lead the uh, the work package on the feedstock um, uh, uh, production. So the um, uh, the objective of this is to. Uh, I present you the increasing resource efficiency with integrated cropping systems and improved harvesting and logistics. 
Um, the work uh, has been uh, done by uh, Chris, uh, uh, Effie, uh, Alex Kulu, and by Unibo, Andrea Monti, Walter Zegada, and Andrea Parenti. Uh, colleagues from CMAT, Carlos Martin Sastre, Luis Esteban, Pilar, uh, Pilar Syria, and uh, it was also, oh, apologies, and CREA for Luigi Pari and Simone Bergonzoni. So uh, the objectives of this uh, work was to increase the lignocellulosic biomass production and feedstock diversification, but without reducing the food crop land. I will not uh, start this discussion with uh, the food versus uh, fuel uh, um, competition. So I move uh, to the uh, ways that we uh, decided to deal with uh, the uh, increase of the lignocellulosic biomass production. First, we checked, we, uh, we researched uh, uh, integrating annual dedicated lignocellulosic and food crops in innovative cropping systems. Then uh, we uh, worked on growing perennial uh, grasses, ded perennial dedicated lignocellulosic crops in marginal nidal lands, and then improving the harvesting and logistics, reducing so as to reduce the biomass losses. So starting with the integrated cropping systems, uh, we uh, uh, had uh, field trials in uh, Spain, Italy, and Greece, uh, innovative crop rotation systems. Um, we selected uh, those uh, three uh, areas uh, because we wanted to have uh, the temperate uh, conditions that uh, could uh, be somehow similar with the Brazilian counterparts. Uh, as you see that uh, those three locations have uh, had different uh, daily um, uh, press daily uh, um, ah, temperatures uh, and uh, cumulative uh, global radiation and precipitation profiles. So we had, uh, we can say that we dealt with three different uh, South European environments. The cropping systems uh, that we used first, the food crop, then the energy crop, legume, and on and on again. Uh, this is the, um, uh, the uh, uh, table to show uh, what the kind of uh, cropping systems that we have tested. Uh, in uh, C, the, crop ro the rotation C it was the traditional one with uh, maize and wheat. Uh, the uh, rotations R1, 2, 3, and 4, um, they dealt with the introduction, the inclusion of uh, um, th of, uh, four crops, one legume and the other three fiber sorghum, kenaf and hemp as uh, energy and uh, industrial crops that were introduced every year, every second year uh, within the traditional uh, agricultural system so as to have a production of biomass but without interfering with uh, the uh, normal uh, agricultural practices. So the uh, results we got uh, down here, uh, you see in the bars, the red bar was for Italy, the blue for Greece and the green for Spain. Uh, what we first uh, wanted to see was uh, the wheat grain yields. Uh, if we uh, um, have any uh, effect on the yields and mainly if we have any negative effect on the, on the grain yields. So we saw in all rotations, that uh, the wheat grain yields remained uh, similar, not affected by the inclusion of the extra crops. In the rotation five, we had the higher uh, wheat yields because we had uh, three uh, more um, uh, additional uh, um, production uh, cycles. While with, uh, with uh, the other crops, we had only one year with uh, green uh, wheat cultivation. Uh, going to the maize, um, Yields again the same thing. Uh, they were not affected in all areas, not affected by the inclusion of the biomass crops. So now going to the biomass yields that uh, was uh, really the target of uh, this uh, this work, we saw that we had uh, uh, su substantially higher biomass yields when we introduced uh, these uh, four crops. Now you see here the yields uh, uh, on from the uh, traditional rotations were mainly the agricultural residues of the food crops, whereas in uh, in the R1 to R4, there were the biomass produced by the other uh, four crops. We saw uh, here that in uh, 
uh, in uh, Italy and Greece. Uh, the uh, vast uh, production of biomass was uh, uh, produced by fiber sorghum, while in, uh, in Spain, uh, the um, uh, Kenaf was uh, uh, presented as the most uh, power, uh, productive one. Uh, and going now to the uh, uh, to see the, how the um, the biomass yields were allocated per uh, per, per uh, source, uh, we saw that um, the majority of the biomass yields were caused were produced by those four crops. The a good thing, the um, interesting thing that we saw here was that uh, in, uh, in Greece and Spain, the uh, majority in the row five, uh, uh, in the row five rotation where it was uh, sun hemp and wheat, the major, the cause for the highest yield was uh, the, uh, the sun hemp uh, biomass production, while in uh, Italy, yeah, this uh, the high yields of the row five uh, rotation was attributed to wheat straw. And uh, going to the soil and feedstock uh, quality, uh, uh, regarding the total uh, soil nitrogen and the um, uh, organic carbon, uh, uh, it was that uh, no large uh, differences between the conventional and innovative crop rotations were uh, uh, presented. And uh, regarding the, uh, the quality of the biomass, uh, we saw that uh, biomass sorghum and hemp had the lowest and the highest mineral concentration respectively. Uh, we had uh, a ash content of uh, from uh, 4.5 up to 6.6, but that was in the range of the straw. Um, uh, ash content and uh, uh, of course the ash content was higher because of the uh, leafy parts of, uh, of the biomass. Uh, uh, and um, since this project was uh, meant, was uh, um, planned as a European and Brazil joint experience, uh, we had uh, the common thing was the sun hemp that in uh, Brazil is used uh, uh, as a rotation every five years to increase the sugar stock yields. And we had uh, seen that uh, there was an increase between five and 15 uh, uh, tons per hectare. So we had produced a uh, paper. You are very welcome to, to, uh, to read on the effects of the integrated food and bioenergy cropping systems on crop yield, soil health, and biomass quality, the EU and the Brazilian experience. Uh, going now to the uh, perennial grasses, uh, we had uh, used uh, existing trials that were uh, 18 to 19 years old in uh, Greece and Italy. Uh, and uh, we have uh, used the, the uh, we can say, we used the Be Cool project in order to uh, keep on with uh, those trials that started so long, so as to have a, a, a very clear picture of what would be the yields produced by these perennial crops during the times, because usually the, um, the trials have a very limited uh, uh, age, like uh, four or five or six years. But uh, with uh, the Be Cool, we had the chance to continue our uh, uh, older trials until so late, I mean, uh, in, in, uh, in their age, uh, 18 to 19 years old. Uh, you see here the first uh, three bars uh, were the uh, Greek trials with uh, the uh, um, zero and uh, medium and uh, very high irrigation rates. And the fourth bar, the green one, was uh, where the yields um, are produced by uh, Italy. Uh, we saw that until uh, yields in the first uh, 10 years were uh, uh, higher than the average for each uh, uh, treatment. Thereafter, yields started to decrease. And uh, in uh, Greece, we had a range of uh, 7 to 14 tons per hectare, 7 tons per hectare for uh, the uh, zero irrigation. I mean, it was a really zero. Uh, the very same plots received no irrigation, just uh, the rainfalls. Um, and uh, in this uh, particular uh, treatment, we had seen that these uh, 7 tons per hectare were almost stable every year. Uh, in, uh, in the higher, the mean of the higher uh, irrigation rate was 14 tons per hectare, while in, uh, in Italy, 
yields were um, the means were uh, about 20 tons per hectare and it was achieved in the 11th year thereafter they started to uh, decrease. Uh, irrigation and fertilization affected significantly the yields in all years in uh, Greece. Uh, I have to say here that in this trial and the, the others to come, uh, that uh, the, um, they were drafted in the frame of uh, other projects, so the, we did not have any common uh, protocol uh, used. Now going to the switchgrass, again we had uh, uh, a long uh, two plantations of a long, uh, long year, long duration, uh, 18 to 19 years for uh, Italy and uh, Greece. And we had also a plantation from uh, CMAT in Spain, but it was only until the ninth year. Uh, here, uh, I, again, we saw that uh, in the first eight to nine years, uh, the yields were uh, above the average they are, thereafter they started to decrease. Uh, the very same pattern, um, three irrigation rates for Greece, uh, one for uh, uh, Italy and uh, uh, one uh, uh, treatment for uh, Spain. And we saw that uh, yields uh, range from seven tons per hectare until seven, uh, 17 tons per hectare, which were the, the range for the Greek trials. And the interesting thing again here was that uh, uh, all yields, the Italian and the uh, yields uh, uh, produced in Spain, they coincided with the medium uh, irrigation rate of uh, Greece. Again, irrigation and fertilization affected significantly the yields, but the, um, uh, the difference was between the zero irrigation and then the other two uh, irrigation levels. Uh, going uh, to, um, we had also wheat tall grass, but it was only for one year. So in order to not to take too much time, I proceed now with the harvesting logistics. Uh, the activities on the harvesting logistics, uh, they targeted the harvesting of wheat chaff, maize cob, and olive brannings. They were focused on the development of harvesting strategies, fine tuning and modification of the available machine to reduce biomass losses during collection and storage and uh, have a better quality of the uh, biomass uh, potential. Uh, now for the, uh, for the olive branding, uh, there were uh, two uh, different tractors uh, used for uh, the branding rake and the phasma combi rake for uh, the residues. Uh, there were um, uh, significant uh, differences in, in the yields between those uh, two different techniques. Uh, again, uh, harvesting logistics were, were dealt with uh, cereal, straw and chaff harvesting uh, using the th thieving technology. And uh, there are many um, parameters here measured, uh, the uh, theoretic uh, field capacity, efficient field capacity, yields and material capacity. Again, we have seen differences between those two uh, treatment systems. Corn cobs harvesting with RACA technology were also tested. Uh, harvesting and logistics uh, trials were done on biomass sorghum as well. And um, uh, regarding the energy crops, there were storage tests for uh, eucalypts and uh, giant reed, where the treatments were um, uh, st uh, storage uh, of uh, stems, uh, whole stem storage, uh, uh, or chipped the biomass, covered and uncovered, firewood, and so on. Uh, again, we had a uh, joint experience with Brazil in the harvesting and logistics, uh, and the aim was to um, identify existing bottlenecks on sugarcane straw and uh, uh, suggest technical solutions. So uh, uh, this activity allowed to define the best strategy to collect the harvestable products in relation to different chemical compositions, harvesting the right quantity without affecting the soil compaction, in order to increase the quality of the harvested uh, products of the processing sector. Uh, the improvements of the uh, sugarcane straw uh, was divulged both to uh, Brazilian and European stakeholders through scientific publications and technology um, uh, transfer activities. Uh, there were here the uh, suggestions for CREA for direct collection of straw and uh, a paper produced uh, in the frame of these activities. 
Uh, and the last but not least, I just added in the last moment that is just to show that we had done also work in uh, identifying agricultural residues using the bioarrays model produced by CMR. And we have seen that was uh, applied in eight countries, as you see here in the map with uh, the, uh, the orange color are the rain fed uh, uh, residues, agricultural residues. That means uh, the, uh, they are mostly uh, wheat. And according to the um, results provided, it seems that uh, France is the uh, biggest uh, biomass producer with 14.5 uh, million tons per hectare of dry matter of agricultural residues, uh, 91 percent of which were agricultural residues and the rest uh, forest uh, and uh, Spain was uh, 19 um, million tons uh, uh, per year again you see here that in all uh, areas uh, the majority was of agricultural nature uh, the rain fed crops are the most important sources for agricultural residues occupying uh, uh, half or even 93 percent of the total surface depending on the country and olive plantations with vineyards were the second in the rank. Uh, regarding the forest residues, the uh, broad-leaved uh, available surfaces rank first, uh, between uh, third, occupying uh, 40 to 76% uh, of the uh, total area in all uh, countries, and conifers came second. So uh, going uh, quickly to the conclusions, we saw that um, Dedicated lignocellulose crops were successfully integrated into, into existing food systems, at least in, uh, in our uh, food, uh, in our uh, integrated uh, um, trials that we used, we tested uh, for uh, over five years now. Uh, we have seen that the feedstock, the biomass produced, uh, uh, and that is uh, going to be uh, used for advanced biofuels, could be uh, higher, it is higher than the control from 1.5 up to three times higher compared to control. Uh, it, does, it did not have, uh, negatively affected food production, neither soil fertility, which was uh, very good. And the feedstock showed interesting biomass quality within the range of straw, in particular for defoliated biomass that had the lower arsen mineral content. Uh, Sunhem performed very well in the te tested environments and is, uh, it is interesting also for its uh, nitrogen fixing ability and efficient logistics, harvesting logistics were designed for agricultural residues and energy crops. And some future perspectives that we uh, intend to, uh, to see in the coming years was the implementation of uh, more integrated cropping systems like relay planting with the winter forages, explore yields in more environments uh, perhaps, so as to have a, a, a view on, the, uh, on more European environments and not only focused on South Europe. Uh, selection of uh, new short season uh, uh, legumes, like Sunham varieties able to produce it at EU level. <laughs> Identification of uh, uh, more efficient harvesting strategies for more energy crops, sugarcane and crop byproducts. And uh, I hope I, I kept the time. I tried to, to do it as, as quickly <laughs> as I could. Thank you for your attention. I'm in your uh, disposal for questions. And uh, also the, uh, the partners, all the partners are here to uh, give you more details uh, regarding each uh, specific task. Many thank thanks. you. Thank you, Merci. Thanks a lot. So you have seen uh, very interesting results from this first part of it, this first component of be cool, especially on the diversification of the uh, feedstock streams for advanced biofuel plants. Um, I would, we are a, a bit behind schedule, so I would like to uh, ask all the other speakers to try and stick to uh, 10 minutes presentation, so uh, if possible. I would like to introduce the next speaker, who will, uh, that is David Caramonti from the Polytechnic of Turin, uh, that will present the results of the second component of BICUL on the uh, conversion processes, uh, thermochemical conversion processes. David, the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maurizio. Let me share the screen. Okay. So, thank you very much. Uh, I'm here as, as record, actually, and uh, 
uh, the slides I'm presenting on behalf of the World Package Coordinator, Anya Wasma from BTT. This package included activities from BTT, Record, TNO, BTG, and DBFZ, mainly, even if the link between the different works is very, is very tight in this project and there was a continuous interaction between the World Packages. So let's move. Okay, the goal of the World Package was to determine experimental uh, performance data for gasification for selected biomasses. This is done at bench scale, uh, one to five kilogram per hour. So we're packaged led by VTT. Uh, I will not go through the, all the parts and for all the task, which is on the slides, uh, to save time. Uh, also to validate uh, pyrolysis for selected TITSOC at bench and pilot, one to 20 kilogram per hour uh, scale uh, in view of subsequent uh, gasification. That was a major point of this work package, to my view, one of the most relevant one. Uh, modeling uh, carried out uh, by VTT with the support of all partners to assess performance and cost for this advanced biofuel chain. Two case studies have been set up for uh, benchmarking this solution. Uh, going through the gasification pathways as uh, indicated by the uh, European codes that uh, we applied to with BICU. And finally, uh, the regulatory framework was in charge of record uh, and uh, some innovation, I mean, is now very glad is reflected in the, in the new policy that's coming in. So basically as shown in the scheme, we've got <coughs> Biomass feedstock, lignin cellulosis, uh, cellulosic that goes to <clears throat> uh, slow pyrolysis, gasification, gas cleaning, and fast pyrolysis. Uh, slow pyrolysis is a pretreatment to generate the slurry for gasification, but also to dry the biomass and, uh, for the fast pyrolysis project uh, phase also. Um, the fast pyrolysis oil is then again gasified, like direct gasification of biomass uh, uh, and char. And the syngas is then subject to upgrading or conversion, better to say, to fissure drop biofuels. You see the relevant partners indicated in the scheme. Gasification of biomass went through the well-known step of gasification, cleaning, upgrading, and uh, synthesis of the advanced biofuels. Uh, this was based on the Milena gasifiers. Uh, you see the component sketch in these slides, and it's going, uh, the process has gone through complete sulfur removal. Um, it has been investigated seam reforming ratio, uh, feed uh, to achieve the required H2 uh, to COH ratio that, as uh, you know, is a key for a subsequent uh, conversion of the gas into the liquid. Uh, CO2 completely captured from the product gas. Fischer-Tropp pilot reactor was, uh, was used here with uh, five days of successful operation and liquid biofuels produced a total uh, yield uh, beyond 3.5 uh, liters of liquid solid hydrocarbon. Uh, gasifier, uh, the gasifier has been operated with eucalyptus sorghum, giant treat pagas, and also pelletization was included in that. Uh, the uh, fields of producer gas composition was identified and the challenges also uh, uh, assessed. Um, the uh, yield carbon conversion uh, to crude fissure trop intermediate uh, carbon uh, was at a range of 70 to 80 percent at 800 degrees. The sorghum and giant reed uh, were found the most difficult ones to, uh, to convert to the process. Uh, compared to eucalyptus, and that is related to the higher count of sulfur and nitrogen that is known for these crops is higher indeed. Uh, it was demonstrated on at around tier five level, the gasification to fissure drop liquid through this work package. Also, uh, the gasification of liquid energy carriers was uh, investigated. It's another way to produce uh, advanced biofuels from lignocellulosic material not through directly uh, producing the pyrolysis and then upgrading the pyrolysis oil or co-processing the refining, but now 
in that case, going through a full gasification step based on uh, pyrolysis oil. So uh, fast pyrolysis bio oils uh, from various biomasses uh, was produced at VTT and sent to BTG for tests on gasification. And pyrolysis has been identified as a natural removal process. So it's quite interesting uh, finding uh, for this route, uh, which can improve the uh, flexibility in terms of feeds of feeding uh, for the world value chain. Uh, then, okay, we had 10 kilowatt oxygen blown off the thermal catalytic reform in, op in operation. Tests have been reproducible. The, uh, the ma mass balance closure was quite good. Uh, gas composition uh, approaches thermodynamic equilibrium, which is also another very good finding. Uh, as said, the most uh, important results uh, on, on a value chain point of view is that biomass feature step do not affect so much the main fissure trap product quality synthesis gas composition. So differently from direct gasification, pyrolysis oil as intermediate uh, assay act as a natural removal step. Uh, so uh, we uh, can conclude through this work package with BTG and BTG engaged that uh, using FPBOs, even if produced from different feedstock uh, in the same gas effect shouldn't be a major issue. Uh, there's a um, co-paper uh, or a paper co-authored by VTT and BTG submitted to energy and fuels. Uh, and data as all work package have been provided to DBFZ for L LCA uh, assessment. And uh, here you see um, the H2, CO2 and CH4 concentration in dry singers in terms of volume percentage. Uh, Biosha was also originally integrated in the value chain. Uh, it has been produced uh, with a good uh, result in terms of output, 50%, uh, uh, which is the sum of sensible and chemical uh, energy content is in the pyrogas output. Uh, uh, this was done in a continuous fixed bed reactor carbon and uh, which is roughly slightly less than 50 kilograms per hour with 100 kilowatt thermal above or beyond a kilowatt, 100 kilowatt thermal of energy recovery is high T heat. Uh, the aqueous phase has been uh, characterized. Uh, similarly, pyrolysis test has been uh, carried out in an innovative continuous over reactor named Spyro. Uh, which will, we will also operate uh, in uh, oxidative mode. Uh, charcoal liquid yields were in the range from 23 to 38% and from 30 to 40% respectively, charcoal and liquid. Uh, eucalyptus, eucalyptus and lignin uh, provided the highest charcoal uh, and liquid yields, sorghum and bagasse the lowest. Uh, the organic rich fraction has been also separated with the water content range in the 12 to 16 weight percent and carbon content 50 to 60 percent uh, on dry basis uh, from the water rich uh, phase. Uh, there's a huge literature on, on this kind of water phase collection and use of the different fraction. Data provided to BFZ. Uh, the interesting thing that has uh, happened in uh, before the end of the project is that, uh, uh, as you know, red to has a number of provision for delegated and implementing act. The implementing act has been voted uh, around March, dealing with uh, uh, sustainable agronomic practices and carbon content in soil. It defines the, uh, the and quantify the data for this in the formula of the uh, greenhouse gas performance of the liquid, the biofuel that is produced. So now we have an ESCA term, it's called like that, in which the, uh, this component from biochar is included with the highest threshold, 45 grams of CO2 per megajoule of fuel produced, which is a very attractive figure. So this means that uh, the sustainability of the advanced biofuels is increased by recovering this charcoal and by using the heat that is generated to dry the biomass at inlet of fast pyrolysis or gasification. So very good energy integration. Uh, but also uh, you can read in a different way that the fixed stock uh, 
feedstock uh, range can be expanded uh, because of this component that contributes to meet the 65% threshold. Modeling has been carried out by VTT, you know, uh, it's a kind of process validation, several case studies, two dealing with the Milana gasifier, one with the intranet flow gasifier has been, uh, uh, have been developed uh, with Fisher Trop yields, which ranges in something between 30 to 45 percent, depends on the number of assumption of, uh, for the moment, and that will be a matter of deliverables uh, from the project. Um, so uh, we uh, provided as work package to DBFZ again this data from modeling uh, the simulation uh, to uh, carry out the LCA study. The cooperation with Baycool and BioValor is described in these slides where blue and green indicates uh, be, blue is the Baycool part and the, and the green is the BioValor. Uh, part uh, and uh, there has been a lot of uh, interaction between BioView uh, Value and Bicool uh, partners. I mean, the two sides of the project and uh, results from some of these routes, like phosphorolysis and gasification of gas and eucalyptus, are going to be compared. Uh, in Bicool, uh, TNO will use uh, BioValue catalyst for fish drop synthesis, as also there were number of discussions on the oxidative pyrolysis uh, part as well. Uh, methods have also been a matter of interactions, uh, so to harmonize this analytical procedures. And round robin uh, with BTG uh, on FBO is ongoing. Unfortunately, some of these activities were planned, but due to the pandemic, uh, have not been, is not, it was not possible to carry out all the uh, initially uh, desired activity for cooperation. I hope this will happen anyway uh, in the coming months and here through uh, continuous cooperation that we intend to continue to carry out. Uh, we expect co-publication and exploitation of those results. Summarizing, uh, gasification has been successfully carried out on various woody and uh, agri biomasses. Demonstration has been uh, performed at TRL5, roughly, uh, for gasification to fissure drop liquid. Um, the uh, ability of pyrolysis to remove some ash related problems uh, is a very interesting mean to widen the fits of base uh, as uh, by pretreating uh, the biomass uh, in the pyrolyzer, in the fast pyrolyzer. Uh, modeling in Aspen class uh, code is uh, is validating the process and, ben and creating benchmarks. Uh, two case studies for benchmarking the Bicool solution uh, upon the existing gasification routes uh, were set up. Uh, regulatory framework standards uh, has been uh, monitored because it's still in continuous evolution. We are now, in the, as as Maria said, in the in the fifth or fifty-five uh, discussion in the heart of the discussion for this, uh, which covers several aspects of the European policies. Biochar has been included in the Clemente Acre for two, and the cooperation with the Brazilian counterpart and the BioValue project is ongoing and will continue. With, uh, with various activities from co-publication, catalyst development testing and development of analytical model methods, and hopefully also other, other methods we, we would like to, to carry out uh, uh, as, uh, as it was the initial intention of the partners. So with this, I think uh, I can conclude and I thank you for the attention. Thank you, David. Thank you, great. Thank you also for keeping the time. So you have seen that uh, the integrated uh, pathways that were uh, thermochemical pathways that were studied in, uh, in this component of BICUL. Now we will listen to uh, the thermochemical activities uh, ongoing in the BioValue Brazilian project by Ricardo Soares from the Università de Federal de Uberlandia. Ricardo, uh, please try and keep the time to uh, nine, 10 minutes, and the floor is yours. I'll try, Maurice. Thank you very much for your invitation, Maurice, and I guess Ernesto, all the UBC organizers, for the invitation, the opportunity to, to show the, 
the results of the joint activity with Bivalent and Bipu. Good morning to everyone. My name is Ricardo Suarez. I'm the coordinator of the Tango Camp Roots Colored Work Package Free in BioValue. First, let me remind you the BioValue, all, all BioValue Work Package Free goals should be sketched. Uh, you can see, oh, sorry. So you, we have the HTO the hydrothermal liquefaction and also the co-processing, but the joint activities relies on, on the pyrolysis né, comparison from, with the oxidative and the, the, the inert pyrolysis with inert, and, and then the gasification, gas cleaning, and, and adjusting of the hydrogen CO ratio for the Fischer trolls. Um, let's start sharing with you. Uh, the crew has started in, in 2017 in BioValue 2009, Brazil and Forcing Cops. It's due to the uh, Brazil and Forcing uh, Polyx problems, I can say. The uh, coronavirus pandemic has led us to adjust in time, many experiments, and not having any in, in the changing research business. I, I guess only I visited some, some big crew groups. Uh, most of the, the teams are going on. Are ongoing papers are being written, and maybe in the next next month we are going to have uh, several maybe papers uh, uh, submitted together. Well, I, uh, due the time, I, I only show some results of the joint activity, the fast pyrolysis and the Fischer trope sequence. Uh, let's start sharing with you some fast parallel results at the bench scale in, in, in IPT that using a PIDE unit. Uh, the main goal is enabling the comparison uh, uh, between the fast parallels with NERD, uh, with the fast oxidative parallels. We can calculate the energy necessary to keep the reaction autothermic by measuring with the, the gas chromatography, the oxygen, the CO2. And we are also developed to, to adjust, uh, we can do that, this calculation. We also developed just a new method for characterizing the fast pyrolysis by oil and even the bio crude from HCl2. So it's adjustment from the Anya and, and Shannon, George Hilder uh, papers, is adjustment for that, and they may be published separate. Um, here uh, we can see the results of the fast parallels of sugar cane bagasse. Um, you can see that by oil yield did not decrease, for example, for comparison with the uh, from the fast parallels and with the fast oxidative parallels, you can see that the oil yield uh, did not decrease significantly when we run the fast oxidative parallels under, uh, and the CO2 production increase, and the bio shot decreased a little. Denoting, uh, you can say that decrease in, in terms of percent, decrease, uh, we observe a high decrease of the bioshock production during the oxidative parallels. Uh, Denote that part of the bioshock may be in situ burning for energy generation. It's a good thing for the autotherm parallels. Next slide, you, uh, uh, preliminary results from our fast oxidative parallels plant, the pilot plant, the bigger one, 10 to 30 kilograms an hour. The, uh, um, let's see, we, we still compare these results with the VTT1 and even with the, the VTG1 too. Moreover, you are adjusting, you are adjusting the, the VTG fast parallels, maybe the VTT2, but at this moment, we are adjusting the VTG fast parallels model for our fast oxidative one. There are some some ba mass balance and three groups of reaction in the in BTG model, we, are, we have to adjust for the 
the molecules that we obtain in, after the oxidative aspirons. Finally, we will share the Fischer trop preliminary results. Here you can see uh, the whole idea of the DTL process. I guess uh, David has already shown you, to you. Um, to produce dropping fuel, uh, fuel by Fischer trop uh, you need two main process. No? Two main process. Uh, here you can see the two main process. The first one is the Fischer trop uh, where we can generate our cans, all affins, or, or even alcohols, depend on the catalyst we, we use. Then we, with cobalt based catalysts, we can have alkanes. With L affins, you can have, uh, well, with, with iron, you can have all affins, and with cobalt copper, you can have alcohols. Um, uh, after that, you have the second. The second process is the, the hydro process. We are going to. We have the major reaction isomerization or aromatization and hydro cracking. And the idea is to integrate uh, to integrate both process and to generate directly the the dropping fuels, the gasoline, kerosene, and diesel, and. Integrate the object to integrate, and, and maybe we can do by integrate the, the two process by using two reacting seeds or even using a co share catalyst where the core in the core part you are going to have the Fischer trop and the, the shell part you are going to have the hydroprocent catalyst. So that's the idea. So thermodynamic, thermodynamic indicates that is easier to isomerize alcohols than olefins and more and then alkanes. So uh, you have, it's easier to have dropping fuel. They say that if you, if you generate from alcohols and olefins, then alkanes. But it's usual to, in Fischer Trop, to use uh, alkanes. So here you can have a comparison of the, uh, the catalyst that we developed here in Brazil. And with the one, the commercial one that uh, Tino sent to us, I don't know the the, the, the owner of this catalyst, but Tino gently sent this catalyst to us and the catalyst performance similar to the Tino, Tino commercial one. Well, you can see here some results from with the iron catalyst and the iron catalyst, we could turn in the the hydrocarb formation in the range of the, the kerosene and, and diesel. Okay. Two minutes. Okay. Um, I would like to acknowledge uh, all the cool colleagues, let me say, uh, Bert, uh, Davi, Anya, Evert. Berend, I, be, I may forgot some of but uh, I would like to acknowledge all the students and researchers of the BioValue teams, our sponsors, and you for your kind attention. And I, I would like to leave out the mixed message. Let's buy the VBQ and this that spin off cross deliver, and let's continue our collaboration in the next project. Thank you very thank much, you. Mauricio. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, Ricardo. Thanks to you. And also thank you for keeping the time. Uh, it was uh, really um, stimulating working uh, on the both sides of the ocean. Uh, it was a bit complicated due to the uh, contingent situation, but uh, we managed. And you, all the teams, all the work package teams were so active in staying connected through periodic meetings. I know that you have been working hard on that. Okay, thank you. And uh, in the interest of time, since I don't see any questions yet, uh, I think it's good to proceed with the, um, the list of presentations uh, uh, so that we can save time for the panel discussion and the debate. There will be four panelists and hopefully if we have time, we can also open the discussion to uh, the other speakers and the attendees. So with this, uh, we 
explore the results of the be cool activities in the thermochemical pathways and the current ongoing activities for B of L. You now uh, it's uh, time to introduce the results on the other pathways, the bio biochemical pathways uh, uh, that were carried out by um, TNO. And I would like to introduce uh, Carla Dusan from TNO. Uh, she will talk about benchmarking of luminous and logic feedstock for efficient biochemical processing. Thank you, uh, Carla, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Maurizio. Um, so for the presentation, as the introduction indicates, uh, I will be talking about one part of the of the work performed in the Be Cool project on the production of advanced ethanol. And this was uh, um, a focus on the implementation of an organosol pretreatment technology um, the, the Fabiola process, which has been developed at TNO. This is an acetone uh, water fractionation process that is uh, performed under mild uh, uh, optimized conditions that can yield uh, relatively high amounts of uh, uh, cellulose rich pulp, C5 sugars in the form of, of hydrolyzide, and a lignin that is considered less condensed than uh, other technical lignins. The original fractionation process was uh, developed uh, having in mind uh, certain conventional hardwoods and some agricultural rescues, but we observed in general variations in the performance of the process due to uh, variability in the biomass composition itself, uh, especially related to extractives content. Um, in view of this, we have been working on the implementation of pre-extraction process as an additional uh, step uh, in the, in the pre-treatment part of the biomass that would deal with, uh, with reducing this, uh, this uh, content of extractives uh, in organic and organic extractives, and therefore um, reducing the variability in the fractionation performance itself. Uh, in this part of the study and uh, in, in Be Cool, we focus on, on the screening and the qualification of, uh, of a wide range of uh, lignocellulosic feedstocks. Uh, through the integrated steps of, of the pre-extraction, the fractionation, um, and then the subsequent parts of uh, enzymatic hydrolysis of the cellulose pulp, as well as the detoxification of C5 sugars, um, and uh, linked uh, and evaluated the, the digestibility of the obtained sugar C5 and C6 sugars toward, towards uh, advanced uh, ethanol. The feedstocks that were included in this uh, in this study uh, were herbaceous biomasses like hemp, uh, sorghum, and giant reed, uh, agricultural residues, wheat straw, and corn stover that were all provided by the activities performed in the work package one of the Be Cool project, and uh, some results. Uh, the, some of the results that I'm uh, going to present today are compare uh, to beech wood as a reference material treated under the same uh, um, subsequent steps. For the analysis of the data, we relied, of course, on the characterization of the biochemical composition of feedstocks and all uh, product streams that were generated through the uh, integrated uh, steps. We perform an acetone water gradient solvent extraction um, in a percolation type uh, bed reactor at lab scale, and also the organosol fractionation in, in a batch type of process um, at a two liter scale. And we implemented uh, so two downstream uh, processes uh, for the C5 sugars detoxification using uh, granular carbon and enzymatic uh, um, saccharification of the pulp uh, using a commercial enzyme cocktail. For the fermentation parts, which was work performed by uh, Wageningen University and Research, uh, two, two different strains were used, uh, Saccharomyces commercial uh, yeast for C6 sugars and uh, an Spatospora pasalidarum strain for the C5 sugar part. Now, a bit of the results uh, for the pre-extraction, we were able to implement uh, the percolation type uh, uh, configuration for the pre-treatment of the biomasses uh, in a robust way, uh, where differences, for instance, in the removal of the ash content or the organic extracted content uh, of the feedstocks was observed between uh, 30 and 60% in the case of the ash and of the extract is between 70 and 90%. Um, the variabilities were also related, for instance, to variations in the adsorbance of, uh, of the solvents by the different biomasses and the bulk densities uh, that are associated to these uh, materials. Um, but in general, um, in average, we were able to increase the lignocellulose content so from 70 on the order from 70% to 82% for, for the biomasses. Now, these uh, pre-treated or pre-extracted biomasses are further fractionated. And in here, I present uh, four different indicators of the fractionation process. So the C6 sugar recovery in the pulp product, the C5 sugar uh, yield in the hydrolysate, 
the, the lignification of the pulp and the lignin yield. For the C6 sugar recovery, uh, a very um, consistent and homogeneous yields were observed across the different biomasses and consistent with the beechwood uh, C6 sugar yield. For the other indicators, the C5 sugar, the, the lignification and the lignin yield, uh, a greater variability was observed but within, uh, within the range or the values that were observed for the beech wood. These were still related to uh, variations in the, in the composition of the biomass, specifically what is related to the um, uh, buffering capacity of the biomasses uh, led, uh, or originated by the inorganic content of the, of the biomass. And it was in particular significant for the, for the hemp uh, feedstocks where a higher acid dosages were, were required for the, for the uh, organosol process. The enzymatic hydrolysis of the cellulosic pulps was also qualified through using a commercial enzyme cocktail from Novoscience at a standard consistency of 10% weight per volume. And in here we present just a comparison of the glucose yields after 48 hours with different enzyme doses. So for most biomasses, uh, uh, glucose yields of about 70% were obtained after 48 hours, and uh, which were higher, higher than for the reference uh, um, beechwood uh, biomass except for the cases of the hemp uh, biomasses, which were more recalcitrant than the, than the um, beech wood. Some additional work uh, that we performed in the, in, the, in the project looked into uh, the implementation of a high consistency hydrolysis process, so in a bioreactor, where we increased the uh, content of the, of the pulp to 25%. Uh, in order to reach higher sugar concentrations in a single uh, in a single uh, unit operation, so through a fed batch uh, uh, procedure, and we were able to increase then uh, product uh, or glucose concentrations of, of the hydrolyzed uh, hydrolyzed from 80 to 170 grams per liter, without any further uh, additional processing of the hydrolyzed. In terms of the fermentation of the C6 sugars uh, for all substrates, a uh, good growth of the, of the yeast was observed, so very similar to the uh, control glucose solution. So this is clean, uh, clean solution of glucose, uh, indicating the, the good fermentability of all the substrates. Uh, for, uh, as a reference, uh, in this uh, screening test, uh, the um, control test can, uh, can achieve about 80% of the theoretical maximum yield of ethanol. And for the different biomasses, um, Sorry, let me just remove this. For the different biomasses, um, the yields obtained from this, uh, from the substrates were of the same order, uh, where the 5%, 3% difference is related to the presence of uh, silos that is still present in the, in the produced pulp from the fractionation. And the yeast, uh, of course, is not, uh, cannot uh, digest this, uh, this sugar. In the case of the C5 sugars from most uh, pretreatment technologies, we can expect a certain degree of uh, degradation of, uh, of the hemicellulose sugars and the lignin. In the case of the organosol pretreatment, we observed a, a range of uh, forfrow formation of 6 to 11% of the, of the C5 sugar content in the hemicellulose. And certain phenolics can be found in, in PPM levels. So for uh, removing these compounds that can be inhibitory for fermentation, we implemented um, a carbon absorption process in a fixed bed uh, using granular activated carbon by, um, by determining or sizing the, the, the system uh, through the characterization of the absorption capacity of the material with a representative hydrolysate of the process. Um, with this uh, approach, we were able to reduce the content of inhibitors in the hydrolysate to less than 500 uh, uh, ppm. And um, uh, additional post-treatment or conditioning of the hydrolysate that is required is related to increasing the concentration of sugar. So of course, these are processes that are diluted in nature and the sugar concentration is to be increased in order to, uh, to be uh, suitable for fermentation. So further evaporation as well of these uh, detoxified hydrolysates can further reduce the content of the inhibitors. Um, slightly higher uh, inhibitor contents were observed in the hemp materials, uh, which are represented by SH and HS here, compared to the other biomasses. In terms of the fermentation of these C5 sugars, again, uh, good growth was observed in most substrates, except uh, for the hemp materials, for which uh, further dilution was required. So at the same uh, degree of, uh, of total sugar concentration, these uh, this, uh, substrates were not fermentable. Um, an, an additional aspect of uh, the C5 sugar stream is the presence of uh, the acetic acid, 
which can generate a bit of a lag phase in the growth of the of the spatasphora. So if you see, yeah, a bit of a delay in the in the growth of the of the of the, of the microorganism compared to the to the control with the pure silos. Now the yields obtained uh, for this kind of fermentation with the spatasphora were of the order for the control were of the order of seventy five percent of the theoretical maximum. And with the substrate, uh, we were operating between 70 and 90% of that, of the control. So where again, the difference uh, remains on the presence of C5, uh, C6 sugars that are also present in the hemicellulose like mannose and galactose, but also derived from uh, um, certain losses of, of glucose uh, or the cellulose during the fractionation. So these uh, sugars are not processable by, by the spatasphora, so uh, still they are not consumed. One minute. Yeah, now to conclude, <laughs> yeah, with this uh, benchmarking activities, we, we were able to see that uh, this uh, wide range of uh, agricultural residues and, and herbaceous biomasses can be readily treated through the integrated steps of pre-extraction and the organosol fractionation with sufficiently high yields of the products after the fractionation. And we implemented su successfully the enzymatic hydrolysis and the detoxification but identified as still some uh, challenges in, in terms of, of the processing of the biomasses, for instance, higher recalcitrants uh, in, the, in the pulp produced from the hemp. Uh, in, the, in these uh, biomasses, uh, also the case of a higher in inhibitor content. So the, the, the downstream processing needs to be adapted to, to these uh, special biomasses or, or further optimized. And for the fermentation in particular, well, there are still open, open uh, aspects of improvement, which is, for instance, a consolidated use of all sugars, C5 and C6, uh, into a single process and the, the, the presence of the acetic acid. And some of the um, uh, strategies to, to address these issues where they can be found on, for instance, on the sequential in implementation of sequential fermentation or the development of co-cultivation of a strain as well as adaptation of the, of the strains to, to the substrates uh, in particular that are being used for the process. Um, of course, uh, the optimization of the upstream part with the downstream is an iterative process where every time you make a, a new development in the fermentation parts need to be also, let's say, commensurate with whatever is uh, implemented in the upstream uh, fractionation. So these two aspects of the integrated uh, concept need to uh, always uh, um, be developed together, let's say. Um, and with that, I would like just to say thank you and uh, refer all the all the participants to the uh, session that will take place tomorrow, a presentation by our partner from uh, Wageningen, and Anna Lopez on uh, other work performed uh, as part of the Be Cool project in terms of uh, fermentation as well. Thanks thank very much. You. Thank you, Carla. Indeed, as I was saying, a lot of the specific research activities of Be Cool are also being presented in the different sessions of the, of the conference. And the project was really large and the cooperation also was really dense. So we really wanted to present the whole overview of the activities because there are many. But um, so I'm sorry for to the, uh, I apologize to the speakers for pushing you a bit, but uh, we still have a a uh, couple of presentations before we move to the panel discussion to understand what is the meaning and the, the progress beyond the state of the art and the meaning of all these results in the current context. Um, so with that, I would like to, in, to invite uh, Fulvio Di Fulvio uh, from IASA to give us uh, an overview of uh, what it means to put everything in context uh, in a scenario uh, of uh, deployment, of large-scale deployment of these lignocellulose value chains. So we will uh, talk about logistics and scenario assessment at different scales of lignocellulose value chains for advanced biofuels. Thank you, Fulvio. The floor is yours. Please try and keep the time of 10 minutes. Thank you, Maurizio. And uh, I will give this presentation indeed uh, about uh, an, uh, impact assessment, which uh, we have produced for the Be Cool project. We're working uh, at the European scale, but also looking uh, more in deep now at the national scale. And this has been made mostly together with my colleague, uh, Sylvain Leduc, uh, and uh, other colleagues here at IASA. And uh, we've been looking how uh, these different scales uh, interact with the biomass potential under a series of uh, scenarios, which uh, I will present. 
Uh, first of all, the first part of the modeling has been starting from the Globium model, which is a land use model. From this uh, land use model, we have derived uh, a series of uh, land use scenarios. In particular, we looked at two different uh, land use scenarios here presented. One is the reference uh, land use, which is aligned for 2030 with the uh, European reference scenarios for energy and transport and emissions. And the other one, it's a more uh, advanced scenario where we have uh, uh, implemented uh, a lower calorie intake, which is named in the, the diet, where we reduce the uh, calorie intake. And uh, this has some consequences on the land use. Uh, all these scenarios were also constrained uh, under a series of uh, uh, environmental uh, constraints, like uh, considering the share of uh, high sustainable, high natural uh, value uh, land, farmland. And uh, we have uh, performed the downscaling uh, from uh, scenarios which were initially at the provide from the model at the resolution of not two administrative units to uh, five arc minutes or uh, two half degree. Uh, so circa uh, 50 by 50 kilometers. Uh, that has allowed us to identify uh, cereal land which is suitable for uh, double cropping or for extraction of straw, and at the same time to identify what will be the abandoned land which will uh, fall after the year 2000 up to, to 2030 uh, out of the agricultural production and will remain abandoned. Indeed, uh, we see in this scenario that uh, we can expect uh, by uh, 2000 and uh, 30 to have uh, abandoned land up to 10 million hectares in the uh, reference scenario and going up to uh, even 15 million hectares in the uh, diet scenario. At the same time, we can see also the uh, orange uh, land, which is available for uh, double cropping, which can go up to uh, 40 million hectares in the reference land use scenario, or uh, it will contract to uh, 40 million uh, uh, circa in the uh, diet scenario. So there is some uh, interaction between the availability, of course, of abandoned land and what would be the availability of land for uh, double cropping, but also the land for straw, which you see in the reference scenario, it's up to 60 million hectares and will contract to 55 million hectares in the uh, in the diet scenario. We have implemented then a series of mobilization scenario. We are named the low, medium, and high which represent different degrees of willingness of farmers to uh, recultivate the abandoned land and to implement the double cropping of the, uh, on the cereal land suitable for double cropping. And uh, we have implemented this in uh, three different steps. Uh, 5%, this low, medium, where we mobilize 10% of the land or 20% of the land in the high. And at the same time, we uh, match this with the mobilization of uh, residues from agriculture in this case, we looked at straw and uh, forest residues with uh, three different level of mobilization at 25, 15, 75% of the uh, potential available. This translates in uh, cost supply curves, uh, which uh, of course has been complemented with the calculation of special explicit costs and emissions. Uh, these are the uh, cost supply curves, uh, which are shown here up to the industry gate. And uh, this shows uh, uh, how much uh, how amount we can mobilize at the European scale of the different feedstocks and uh, how much will be their uh, supply cost here. It's uh, per ton their matter, but the same curves were produced also for uh, uh, in terms of euro per uh, gigajoule. Uh, in terms of energy. Uh, this is uh, a special explicit layer which was produced at the 50 by 50 kilometer, which is fed also in the beware model, which perform an optimization of the spatial location of the uh, conversion processes. And uh, I will show some example of this later. Uh, so this uh, supply course, of course, shows us that the uh, larger potentials uh, uh, is usually coming from the ST2, which is the uh, straw. Uh, but we see that uh, quite significant potential is coming also uh, over uh, in the 
high, high mobilization scenario, even uh, 50 million uh, tons per year can come from uh, SO3 cereal, which is double cropping of uh, uh, sorghum on uh, cereal land. And uh, of course, we have also quite significant potential from the green lines uh, in terms of uh, uh, logging residues from the forest, which was provided from the G4M forest management model. And we see that uh, lower potential is coming from uh, a cluster of crops uh, which are miscanthus, poplar, uh, chain reed, and uh, uh, eucalyptus, which uh, appear in, indeed in the abandoned land. We are speaking of potentials up to uh, 5 million uh, tons per year. Uh, so if you look at now uh, the use scale and look at the, uh, what will be the future uh, demands and how much we can mobilize profitably uh, this potential, we have uh, looked uh, uh, in a situation where we'll have high demand and high price for the biomass and we have uh, looked how much of these supply curves will be mobilized. Uh, under the three uh, land uh, mobilization scenario, we see that uh, uh, if we look at the policy objectives uh, by 2030, where we can expect a need uh, for advanced biofuels uh, uh, up to uh, 80 million tons per diameter per year, we see that these uh, policy objectives can be satisfied only if we go for a medium on a high mobilization of this uh, uh, abandoned land plus the uh, 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 plus the double cropping, plus the residues. We see that uh, if we go for a low mobilization, will not fit in what we uh, see the uh, current as policy objectives under the fit for 55 uh, in the higher line. And uh, especially if we look at the residues alone, so the blue and the green coming from the straw and the forest, we will not have enough biomass again for satisfying these policy objectives, neither under the medium scenarios. Uh, on the right side, we see uh, what will happen also in terms of uh, emission from the supply chains. Uh, we see also that emissions are not directly proportional to the uh, mobilized amounts, but they are also depending on the uh, type of uh, cultivation uh, which is performed. If we look at the, uh, especially on the bottom, we see that uh, there is a series of negative values or negative emissions since uh, some crops uh, like the perennials uh, through their improvement or especially of soil organic carbon can compensate uh, the emission in the uh, supply chain up to the uh, conversion uh, or industry gate. Uh, on the other side, we see that uh, some other crops, uh, uh, neither emissions are proportional to the mobilization because we see for uh, sorghum, especially in yellow, uh, there is a quite uh, uh, significant uh, uh, larger emission compared to mobilization of uh, straw. Uh, so that's uh, uh, another uh, interesting results and also uh, a place where to optimize further the uh, mobilization, so possibilities to reduce the emission in the supply. Uh, we have calculated also One series minute. of. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> okay, I will go very fast. And uh, so, so uh, indicators uh, at use scale for uh, uh, quantifying what will be the possibility to generate uh, profits or uh, employment. Uh, and it's interesting that in terms of employment, we can see up to 50,000 uh, 50, uh, new uh, employees in the sector, or uh, we could see also slight reduction in terms of uh, biodiversity uh, loss in Europe when converting abandoned land to uh, some of the energy crops. Uh, the assessment was also uh, performed in a special uh, explicit way, and uh, now we are at the phase where identifying the most uh, promising location with the beware model for uh, the conversion uh, facilities. And uh, here we see different steps of allowing a different number of uh, facilities per country, which uh, biomass is taken up. Uh, and we see that if we allow more uh, and higher number of facilities, of course, it's a larger spread uh, through the country, but also more diversification in the uh, biomass sources, which is being uptaken by the model, which optimizes the uh, costing and emission for the supply chain. 
uh, and uh, that's uh, uh, overall uh, uh, comparison of the uh, different dimensions considered and uh, from uh, this uh, overall uh, comparison of different dimension we can see that uh, especially uh, biomass coming from the sorg or some amp is uh, very promising in terms of uh, potentials but on the other side we see also as i say that for sorg we will need to reduce the uh, emissions from the supply chain still and uh, other uh, streams are very relevant like residual streams uh, but we have seen they uh, have uh, have high profitability, but uh, they are not the best in terms of emissions because we have seen that uh, perennials, as an example, performs much better than them, even if they have a very limited uh, amount. So this is very last slide. Uh, so what is the main conclusion that we will need uh, to combine the different source of biomass to achieve the objectives? Uh, the police objectives and then we need to uh, perform this combination uh, based on the mapping of the resources uh, a mapping where we have a, a possibility for double cropping or a fallow land for uh, crops like sorghum or sunamp or we have more abandoned land suitable for perennials or in the nordics more forest residues which will enter into the mix for satisfying the future demands so thank you for uh, your attention again, and uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed it. Thank you, Fulvio. And uh, I did, uh, you know, we had already exchanged in the past, and I find these results really extremely interesting. Uh, again, apologies for um, urging you a bit, uh, but uh, the, the agenda is really dense. Uh, and we look forward to taking up again these uh, these parts of, of these results in the in the panel discussion, which will start after the last presentation, this time from Brazil. So we managed to catch catch up with the time a bit, so we might be able to start the panel in time. I would like to invite Mateus Chagas from the Centro Nacional de Pesquisa em Energia e Materiais Brazil to provide the. Uh, point of view from bio value of a possible scenario of a Brazil EU integrated biomass value chain. Thank you, and please stick to the time of um, 10 minutes. Thank you, Maurice. Maurice good, good afternoon. Uh, so I'll, I'm talking about the, the Bureau of Brazilian and European integrated value chains for the this international collaboration between BioValue and BICO. And sorry, uh, the, the work package five of Brazilian BioValue project has the overall objective of to identify through integrated sustainability assessment, the most promising value change for the production and use of advanced biofuels. In our case, our focus is on aviation biofuels. So to, to, to assess those, those integrated value chains, we start with the feedstocks, considering the different biomass production systems, which are studied by work package one. Then we include the logistics chains studied by work package two. And finally, we in integrated biochemical and thermochemical conversion routes for the production of advanced biofuels, which are studied in work practice three and four. So about the, the integrated Brazilian and European value chains, it is important to, for, for the, those value chains that they reflect regional differences. And it's important to mention that we, we do not intend to define or propose public policies with this cooperation study. We, we only want to create technical, economic, and environmental basis for the comparison of the, the alternatives. So uh, we, we assess the biofuels and intermediate uh, carbon footprints, product production costs, economic viability, and, and so on. 
taking a look to the integrated proposed value chains, we start with the biomass in the Brazilian case, we have the sugarcane residues and eucalyptus, and in Europe, we will have a, a, a mixed bi biomass sources. In, in both cases, we have fast pyrolysis and gasification as part of the, the conversion chain, chain to produce the biofuels, even through the gasification of biomass or the gasification of bio oil coming from the, the fast pyrolysis. The biofuels can be used to supply even Brazilian or, or European markets. And in the Brazilian case, we have also the possibility of product inter intermediate streams like the pellets or the bio oil from fast pyrolysis, which can be uh, a densified form to, to transport biomass pr pr produced in Brazil to supply the the, the chain in, in, in Europe. So it's important to, to have the, this possibility in, in mind. So I, I selected here some preliminary results for, for the fast pyrolysis and gasification of sugarcane residues in the, the Brazilian part of the, the, the value chain to be presented here. It's important to mention that it's, it's uh, an ongoing study, so uh, we, we don't have finished it, but we, we have some preliminary results to, to show. Starting with the, the, the baseline, considering a typical sugarcane Brazilian mule with the capacity to process 4 million tons of sugarcane per year, with a um, production area of 500 hectares, an average biomass transportation distance of 35 kil kilometers. And in the typical case, the gas and the straw is you are used to, to produce surplus electricity. For the, the first scenario, we consider in the integration of a gasification plant in, in this typical Brazilian sugarcane mill, where the gasification plant uses all the gas and straw to be gasified in an integrated process and then produce it advanced biofuels with this uh, gasification plus fischer dropship process. A variation of this gasification of biomass scenario is the possibility of a, a centralized gasification plant, which can receive the surplus of the gas and, and the straw of uh, a different number of Brazilian sugarcane mules to be gasified in this centralized unit. Similar to the gasification process, we can integrate it, the, the fast pyrolysis plant in order to produce the, the bio oil, which can be then gasified in, in centralized gasification plants, which led us to the few more scenarios of the, the gasification case in, in Brazil. The bio oil can, could be also uh, sent to, to be gasified in, in Europe, but in this case, in, in this, this preliminary results, we are presenting just the, the Brazilian part of the, the value chains. So starting with the intermediate product of fast pyrolysis bio oil, we have selected here some uh, results from the economic assessment. We, we have the integrated case in a, typical Brazilian sugarcane meal with the 4 million tons of sugarcane per year. And in the standalone fast pyrolysis case, we, we have selected a, a case with the same processing capacity in order to facilitate the, the comparison. But then we, we, we will present a, a, a sensitive analysis for the, the capacity of this Fast for all these planes. 
It's very uh, uh, wonderful. Uh, uh, Sorry, sorry I, I believe someone has the, the microphone on. Now it's fine, now it's fine. Oh, okay, thank, thank you. Please, uh, you have two minutes. <laughs> oh, thank you. Regarding the, the CapEx, we, we have the uh, higher CapEx in the integrated plant since it has also the, the, the plant to produce the ethanol. The, the OPEX as well, is higher because we have the all the, the sugarcane opex here, but the regarding the, the production costs of the bio oil, we, we have the benefit of the the integration with with ethanol, leading to a high uh, a lower production cost for the the bio oil in this integrated phase. Regarding the 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 capacity. Uh, sensitivity analysis, we, we, we can perceive that higher is the, the, the capacity of pest pyrolysis, lower is the, the bio-oil production costs in, in, in the standalone plant, but in the integrated plant, since we have more sugarcane being processed for higher capacity, the, the bio-oil production costs starts to, to increase again. For the, the gasification scenarios, we have the first to represent the, the gasification of biomasses and the, the, the scenarios three and four, the gasification of bio oil. Again, we, we, we fix the, the same capacity for all the, 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 the case in order to, to, to the results being comparable. We have higher capacity investment in the integrated case as well as the operational costs but it's important to 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 note here that the operational costs for the the case where the bio oil are is used to to, to be gasified uh, is higher as well because the the costs are associated with the this bio oil acquisition uh, Regarding the sensitivity analysis, again, we, 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 we see that higher is the capacity of the gasification plant, lower is the jet fuel production cost. We selected here the, the jet fuel, but it's also valid for other biofuels. And the gasification of biomass seems to be better than the gasification of the, the bio oil. But for longer distances, and higher emission cost, associated costs, this uh, can, can, can be inverted. We, we can uh, see that the gasification of bio oil starts to, to be uh, more economically viable for the, those cases. And finally, we, as I mentioned before, it's an ongoing study. We, we need to finish the, the assessment for other biomass, in the Brazilian case, the case of eucalyptus, and, and for pellet scenarios as well. We, we need to integrate the, the assessment with the, the logistics assessments, consider, taking into account the regional aspects of biomass production and availability. And the collaboration with Bicol's institution and research will continue. So I would like to thank you. And thank you. That's all. Thank you, Ma Mateus. Thank you. And thanks to all the speakers. We managed to catch up with time. And uh, it was a very dense uh, agenda. Uh, as you have seen, the two projects are very uh, prolific, I would say. So it was good to have an overview of um, the activities and the results on both sides. Uh, but please bear with us. So I would like to thank again the speakers and the attendees for staying so long, but please don't leave uh, because now we start the, uh, the discussion, the panel discussion. And for this, I would like to Mm, pass the floor to Andrea Monti, 
to moderate uh, the the panel discussion with uh, the panelists. Thank you, and Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mauricio. Uh, good afternoon uh, again. So uh, we will take advantage of this uh, about 30 minutes left for the panel uh, uh, session to know uh, the viewpoints on um, options of our estimated colleagues uh, uh, that have been working in, uh, on biofuels for many years, has also involved uh, somehow directly and indirectly involved in the, in the BICOOL and uh, BioValue projects. Um, so particularly we will discuss on the main outcomes in the, in the project in the light of uh, um, changed circumstances. So I'm pleased to, um, to welcome on this panel session uh, Maria Giorgiado, uh, European Commission, uh, Barry Elberson uh, from the Wageningen University and Research, Diogo uh, Simoes, uh, Professor of Biochemistry University Federal di Pernambuco, uh, I Canula, uh, I Canula of the International Energy Agency and uh, David uh, Chiaramonti, uh, professor of the um, Politecnico di Torino. Uh, so, uh, a general comment, I think it, we, we all agree that the uh, world has really changed a lot since the, uh, the BICOOL and BioValue started. Uh, so in just a few years, uh, most of our certainties and paradigms are, uh, I think, radically changed. Uh, well, perhaps it's better to say that uh, uh, our objectives on renewable are more or less the same, but what is changed, uh, uh, in my opinion, is the urgency of finding and implementing concrete solution. And it's precisely this urgency, I think, that uh, uh, makes things very different today than in the past. So what I mean is that uh, uh, essentially what was an option uh, uh, just a few years ago, it is an urgency uh, and the master today. So we have seen that uh, uh, this very, I think very clearly in the presentation of uh, Ilka, also in the presentation of uh, Maria. Uh, therefore, I, I would say uh, we, we have to make a choice uh, to get into groove uh, and to, to make a rapid progress toward the reducing the emission today. So for this reason, I strongly believe that uh, uh, biofuels and more generally bioenergy will say uh, should be today more than ever uh, the subject of the business plan, the deployment, investments. Uh, I would say now or never, <laughs> if we want to capitalize all uh, the knowledge we uh, gained uh, from so many efforts, uh, projects, uh, resources invested so far. Um, well, biofuel will be likely not the best solution. I know that, nor it will be the most efficient, most probably, but they are for sure uh, uh, what we have today. Uh, maybe uh, the best solution we have today and maybe in the next 15, 20 years in order to mitigate the negative effects of gasoline and fossil fuel in the transport sector. Uh, we will not completely phase out, uh, of course, fossil fuel, gasoline, diesel uh, uh, with the biofuels, but biofuels can significantly help mitigate the negative impacts. I think electric vehicles, uh, green hydrogen, other renewables are likely more sustainable, more effective uh, alternative than biofuels, but they need time to establish. Uh, whereas, as I said previously, uh, we need to be pragmatic by implementing uh, urgent action and to apply solution today and on a large scale with significant impact. Uh, so I would like to, to make a uh, Two round of question to um, Berin, David, Yogo, as be cool by a value partner. And after that, I will kindly ask Maria uh, and Ilka to uh, provide their general view and remarks. Um, so um, I think more or less you have uh, uh, Berin, David, Yogo, three, four minutes uh, uh, to replay. Uh, then we, if we have enough time, we go also through the uh, chat to see if there are uh, other questions.
question. So the first question I would like to ask to Berin first, then David and Diogo, uh, is about the general relevance of the main results received in the coolant by value, particularly in the light of the current energy context, uh, taking into you know, account the presentation we have seen by Maria and Ilka and the IPCC R6 report on mitigation strategy and the need of uh, energy clarification. So please, if you, um, Berin, I don't see you anyway. Are you here? Otherwise- Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, so but I can't get my video working. Okay. So if you would like to start with this first round of uh, answers. Yes. Um, yeah, I, um... Yes, regarding the relevance, uh, I think the uh, the interesting thing uh, about uh, Biku and Bio Value projects uh, is that uh, they work on the on the whole chain. Um, so uh, we have uh, seen the results that Mivsini presented, and uh, I think um, Biku advanced a lot on the biomass sourcing options that there are for uh, for advanced biofuels. Uh, particularly on uh, uh, the the potential of uh, um, uh, 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 double cropping systems and also cropping options of perennials. Uh, so there there's a lot of progress made, uh, particularly because of the the wide number of real field trial uh, uh, information uh, that was generated. Uh, also on the part of the uh, harvesting uh, technologies that were really proved and tested in, in the fields, uh, both uh, in Europe and also in Brazil. Uh, and then uh, also the uh, characterization of the biomass, and that was input into uh, the conversion technologies that were uh, developed as uh, presented by uh, David. And uh, this um, uh, it, is, of course, very, very strong. And uh, because of that really integrated information, both uh, well-developed and advanced information on both the sourcing and the whole conversion processes, the work package two and five were able uh, to uh, uh, design a wide diversity of advanced biofuel delivery chains uh, for Europe. And uh, these chains were then um, uh, further assessed uh, in uh, consequential attributional uh, LCAs uh, and also uh, um, cost um, uh, uh, costing assessments and also in the integrated uh, tools of uh, beware globium be uh, and uh, be um, logistics uh, and bioloco. And uh, so the assessments were done at different geographical levels. Uh, Woodville presented the results at EU level. Uh, we uh, presented, uh, I presented yesterday results at uh, regional case study level. Uh, and the, the uh, interesting thing is that um, we know now better what the mitigation potentials are per type of chain, what costs are involved, uh, how much advanced fuel production can there be in the EU under different scenarios and to which extent this will fit with the uh, future uh, demands uh, for biofuels. Um, so uh, yes, these are, I think, many uh, advances. Um, yeah, many advances were made on TRL level of logistical design models of um, well, in, in all fields, really, uh, that, that were assessed uh, uh, in, in, in the project. Uh, and finally, we understand much better what biomass potentials for advanced biofuel production are there. And much more about the realistic mobilization levels that, that, that we need. And um, yeah, that we need, I think. And that is always how we have been having so many potential biomass potential studies, but the 
the realistic understanding of this has improved a lot, I think, in the, in, in the Big Group project and certainly also in, in BioValue for, uh, for what I've, uh, I've seen. So do you, th this morning we have seen that uh, there is a huge amount and potential of biomass in Europe to be mobilized for, uh, to be used for, bio for biofuels. Uh, so the, the, the amount of biomass is uh, really considerable. So based on the studies and be cool, uh, you think that uh, can be uh, the logistic concepts that you, you, you have uh, designed in the Be Cool project could be sustainably implemented uh, uh, or, uh, or they still need further adjustments? You, you... Well, I think there's really a difference between these high level assessments, uh, which uh, produce many uh, uh, yeah, they're they are based on many many assumptions. But I think the the, the regional uh, case study assessments still need to be added to such uh, studies to really understand the possibilities to locally source the biomass and to create uh, the chains that are needed. So I think you need both. Uh, to understand which chains are indeed going to make a difference uh, in, in terms of greenhouse gas em emissions cost and, and uh, reaching our targets. But then you really have to make it happen uh, by doing these regional studies. So we need to increase the, a lot the number of pilot case studies, I think, to have to get more real data and uh, examples. Say, examples. Yeah, and also the, the, the mobilization of, the, of all the stakeholders involved. Uh, so you, we, we have to create awareness and interest for, for these uh, new chains. And uh, what's in it for farmers? What's in it for foresters? Uh, what, 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 what's in it for regional development? Um, uh, and yeah, and, and also on the biodiversity, uh, of course, I mean, I, I do think it's very valuable to, de to do these uh, indices uh, developed on on potential biodiversity impacts, but biodiversity is such a complex uh, aspect that you you can only say uh, something reasonable about biodiversity impacts if you look at local levels. Okay, so David, what do you think about the results received in the Be Cool Biovalue project in the in the today context and bio and energy, I would say, context. Yeah. Well, actually, thank you, uh, Andrea. Actually, since when I started uh, two years, three years ago to teach energy economics, uh, the world has gone <laughs> in, a, in an earthquake. First the pandemic, then the energy crisis, now the Ukraine event. So uh, many things have, have turned upside down. And uh, my main points are that uh, today and in the coming years, I'm sure the commission that will need some time to elaborate on this, on this issue, uh, uh, the focus is, uh, I don't want to say shifting from decarbonization to security, but is accompanied by security. Uh, together with decarbonization, the two things are not competing, the two things run together. So there is no alternative to decide. I mean, if we can produce more renewable fuels or low carbon fuels, we also diversify and uh, improve the security overall of, of a region. And uh, in this, uh, I mean, uh, the Americans have always been much, uh, you know, explicit than us. Uh, I remember uh, the, the law that supports renewable fuels in the U US is named Energy Independence and Security Act, which tells a lot about the mentality. It, it says it regulates the same thing as the Renewable Energy Directive for the fuels. So under this spotlight, uh, I think uh, uh, that uh, we have even more uh, interest in developing these value chains both European, but also globally through cooperation with other regions of the world, because diversifying is also a mean to secure an energy system. Uh, 
and therefore this value chain i think uh, uh, could find more room for work of course the the bioenergy has uh, an inherent complexity i mean it's much much easier to explain a photovoltaic field or a windmill park uh, rather than a complex value chain as bioenergy from a from a political point of view i mean it's a complex concept it can be done well it can be done badly depending on how the value chain is designed and operated so i recognize that it's not an easy an easy concept and i think this is where the uh, independent institutions like academia research organization could help to create uh, a sound uh, uh, evidence of what can be done in a sustainable way um, in these days, we are discussing a lot about natural gas and oil from, from Russia import, for example, and, and we perfectly fit into this, this uh, scheme. In my presentation at the opening of UBC, I was showing the price variation of natural gas, oil, and ethanol lipids. Well, Ignacellosic, uh, there's no need to show this data. And I think there are many interesting points to rise. Also, uh, from the purely economic point of view, I think the debate now is about investing our resource on, on, um, on fossil or renewables. Just to be practical, for example, we are discussing now to create a new pipeline from, uh, from uh, Egypt out, of, of um, offshore Egypt. It is called ISMAT which would complement the other gas pipeline. But one thing is to maximize the existing infrastructure. Another thing is to build new ones. The TAP, which is only the part of the Southern Gas Corridor, uh, took uh, almost 17 to 18 years to, to move from a feasibility study to gas the pipe. And it costed some 5 billion euro, if I recall by memory. So my point is, if we go for a new one and not to, 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 improve, to, to increase the production and the transport capacity of the existing infrastructure, if we allocate this fund and time to renewables, we will probably get more with a, with a higher impact on the society in terms of economic impact. Because if we develop value, uh, biofuel value chain, we also develop economic activities then from a member state point of view will be uh, will reinject the recovery funds into uh, the real economy of a country okay that's yeah, my point i i agree with you that is a complex uh, matter and uh, very very uh, not easy not easy at all to do because we have to take into account also you know, uh, comparing to other renewable here, for example, the interaction with the food and, and so on. Um, so let's, uh, let's see now the, the, the point of view uh, of Brazil. So with uh, Diogo, Diogo, what do you think about that? The main outcomes we achieved and uh, uh, the importance of the importance of the the modern context. The modern context. Yes, uh, thank you, Andrea. Do you hear me? Yes, yes. Do you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. So I, I think that uh, I fully agree with the uh, urgency that you have stressed in your uh, speech that it, it has increased, in, in fact, uh, during the late the last years. And uh, one thing, one thing I, I believe is, is uh, a clear uh, learning from these uh, times and from our uh, joint project is that we must foster collaboration. Because uh, in order to, to, to be able to, uh, and to speed the uh, substitution of fossil fuels, for instance, uh, or take advantage of all the synergies that, that must be uh, present in order to uh, to, to attain our goals, we much increase the collaboration uh, between uh, all countries, in fact. So I, I do believe that uh, the insights that we have uh, 
that we could see from our giant projects, showing, for instance, that the, 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 the situation in, in different countries may be very different and may, uh, may uh, provide or may need different solutions in each case. And, uh, and this, uh, this kind of uh, learning uh, would not be uh, as, as important as it is if we uh, do not uh, exchange views and exchange information and exchange data. So uh, I insist that for me, it is the, perhaps one of the main uh, relevance uh, of, of these uh, joint projects. But the second one uh, I would like to, to stress is that, as we all know, of course, uh, there's, there's uh, uh, advanced biofuels would also profit from, from other initiatives. And one of these is electrification, uh, in fact, because, uh, for instance, one of the less explored in our projects, a uh, way of uh, maximizing uh, the utilization of uh, lignocellulosic materials or uh, renewable uh, feedstocks is the uh, possibility of taking advantage of the very pure CO2 um, streams that, uh, that arouses, arises in, biogen in biochemical and also in thermochemical conversions. And uh, in order to take advantage of this uh, uh, possibility uh, to, to, to uh, the availability of um, cheap and clean electricity is key. And uh, for in, that's uh, another reason for, uh, to, to understand that the complexity of the, of the <laughs> as David stressed, of the uh, bioenergy concept uh, uh, is, our, uh, is also in the fact that uh, it, it cannot be uh, think it in a, in a in, in an separated form. So it, it must be integrated with other uh, initiatives of reducing emissions. And one of the most important is in the electric uh, generation um, sector. So uh, I the and the the final point that I think that it's interesting to stress is the fact that I, I believe that the projects, uh, the two projects have shown or have stressed or have insisted on the interest of uh, taking advantage of integrating and um, process. Uh, the example of the sugarcane biorefineries is, is quite, uh, uh, quite, uh, speaking about this and uh, I think that this this uh, kind of uh, res reasoning uh, concerning the integration of different processes and so on is is also uh, something to be uh, further stressed in the in the coming years that's it okay Sorry, I have my microphone. Sorry, I have my microphone. Uh, I think that uh, I think you close the microphone. Close the microphone. Because there is an echo. Because there is an echo. Maybe the other. Maybe the other. Yes. Okay, so the very little time remaining now, so I want to proceed. The the voice, the Mauricio will complain with me, and I want to go to the second question. Sorry, Andrea. If you need some more time, you can stay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> anyway, I don't. <laughs> Try to, to stay in the time uh, uh, we we have scheduled. Uh, the second question is on uh, you, Diogo. You partially uh, answered me, uh, but the second question is on the scientific cooperation between uh, Brazil and Europe. Uh, um, I mean, uh, from the scientific point of view, uh, and basing on the, on the experience you you got from in the Big Cool and BioValue. Uh, what issue uh, do you think, what issue should be addressed to make this cooperation even more efficient, even more uh, sound and solid? Uh, 
So in other words, what is your, what is your uh, take home message uh, of this cooperation project? What do you think where, where we should uh, develop further this cooperation? Uh, Berin, if you want to start again. Yes, uh, my camera is still not working. Um, yes, well, uh, yeah, yeah, many things. Um, well, for, uh, have for, for, for the cropping part, eh, many uh, cropping systems uh, and harvesting techniques have been uh, field tested in both the EU and, uh, and in Brazil and results compared and shared and discussed and improved. So there was a joint solutions uh, found um, on the log logistical models. Had, uh, well, th there was a lot of uh, uh, exchange on the beware model and eh? the beware model uh, uh, Brazilian uh, uh, researchers have have uh, trained have been trained to use the beware model and it's also been uh, developed further for the Brazilian situation um, uh, a lot of uh, intensive collaboration on the LCA assessments eh? Uh, and the, the full chain assessments, because this is really data and, and knowledge intensive work. And uh, it was very good that we could exchange a lot of parameters and information uh, between the projects and uh, do a joint fact finding uh, to do the, the, the optimal uh, assessments in, uh, in our LCAs and, and chain uh, uh, designs and reviews. Uh, although, of course, the Brazilian situation is very different from the European and that also we, we got that much sharper uh, because of the, the, the comparison that, that we could make. And we are also working on uh, better understanding the options to source advanced biofuels, for example, produced in Brazil to the EU and vice versa. And the interest to do this for both continents and also doing the same for sourcing intermediates uh, have from Brazil to EU. Uh, and, and what would that, uh, uh, what advantages would that give us? So that there we are, we're really collaborating uh, closely and developing an, an article on that. Um, yeah, so yeah, <laughs> I take enough time, I think. Andrea, are you talking or? I have to close my, <coughs> my microphone. David, uh, I, I, I ask it if you have some comment, uh, any comment on that. To about the, the what you, how, how you think, another simple word, how you think this cooperation based on the experience you had, what is uh, the main point you think that should be addressed in the future? Yeah. Uh, well, I think, uh, and that is something we are, we are seriously looking uh, into for various reasons in this moment, that cooperation must be strengthened under this, uh, this case. I can make a very simple example. Uh, ethanol is produced in a very sustainable way in Brazil and advanced biofuels we have seen, given the agricultural infrastructure and the knowledge that is in Brazil could also in the future be produced there. Uh, we are facing the problem of diversifying oil import. Uh, so it's a question I do to myself also, why not having a, a joint effort with Brazil to increase the import of a good ethanol they already produce from sugar cane, we know, but even better from advanced biofuels, from bagasse trash, uh, sugarcane trash or other systems, uh, in parallel to producing ourselves what we can produce, to diversify the import from Russian oil. I mean, I'm quite astonished today this is not on the, on the discussion. I mean, we have uh, uh, our policymaker traveling to uh, potentially gas producing countries, but why not traveling to Brazil to discuss uh, in, increased imports of ethanol? Uh, and I mentioned just ethanol, could talk about HVO or others, uh, which is truly sustainable uh, to diversify our input. Of course, on top of this, 
what I was saying before, you can make a long-term plan and introduce advanced technologies, advanced value chain, new crops, all that has been studied is the same. We should do, to my opinion, with Africa, which is our neighbor here, same concept. And of course, try to deploy as much as possible the, the potential we do have in Europe, particularly uh, given the climate change in the Southern Europe, we, we do have uh, to, to find alternative solution and this can be one. Again, it's a, it's a picture composed by many, many elements, but to my opinion, cooperation with Brazil and South America should be uh, one of our priority, uh, if I look from a diversification and security point of view, and also decarbonization, because we're talking about, and that's my last word, we are talking about importing renewable fuels and not importing oil from Brazil in that specific case. It's a renewable fuels that we're dealing with. So why not? And nobody's talking about that. And it's, I don't understand why it's... It's quite surprising to me as well. I think it's a sort of complementarity. You know? uh, we can go in parallel to develop oil fuels in Europe. And on the other side, we can increase our cooperation in an advanced country that uh, is uh, still producing a lot of uh, uh, biofuels today. Uh, Diogo, would you like to add uh, something about that? Uh, something about that uh, before? before? Yes, just, just uh, uh, a, a phrase on that. And it seems to me that what we have just uh, heard from David and also from Darian uh, stresses the point that I, I was making before. Uh, in, in order to, to increase the possibility of sourcing uh, either biofuels or intermediates from these countries, from Brazil, for instance, which seems to me a, a, a very interesting alternative for using imported oil in, from the European point of view. But a way of doing that is, is, is exactly to, to enhance the uh, substitution of the uh, utilization of these biofuels in these countries, meaning that, for instance, the uh, increase in electrification will make more ethanol available for other utility, for other users or other consumers, let's say, like this. So it seems to me that all things are, are very, as David insisted on the security point of view, which has been stressed by the pandemic and also from the the very recent events, but we we have to, to reason in a let's say like wider uh, concept of security, meaning that uh, all interests must must have to to be taken into account. That's it. Okay, thank you, Diogo. Okay, thank you, Diogo. Please close your microphone. Please close your microphone. I see the uh, Ricardo. You raise your hand. Maybe you have a you are, have a comment on that, Ricardo. Uh, okay, I guess Matheus has shown in his presentation that we have suggested the advanced biofuel exportation from Brazil to Europe, right? Yes. Okay. We have seen before. Yes. If I, I didn't understand very well about the uh, David comments, because I guess he suggests the, this this path, uh, Brazil, Brazil to Europe, uh, direct uh, biofuel exploitation. So, yes, this is a Brazil. political issue. I think is uh, it, it as we said before. We as a scientist is not uh, our business, I would say. But anyway, we are surprised to see that. Uh, that at least in Italy, we are talking a lot about now Angola and uh, other uh, African countries for just uh, some uh, cubic meter of uh, gas, but nobody talks about the uh, great opportunity to increase the trade with Brazil. Uh, okay. I have a question oh. to all the European. How about the impact of the Ukraine war for this, uh, this problem that we are facing right now in the short term about the, the financial support and, and politics to, to, uh, to 
avoid uh, in the future, next future, the uh, gas or fossil fuels from Russia, or you by by using uh, biofuels or any sustainable energy source resource. Well, this is a complicated issue that may, maybe deserves uh, just an inter entire session. And this may be never ending discussion today, so we do not have time. I, I, am, I give now the floor to Maria at first, and then I'll cut for the um, conclusive comments and remarks, basing on what we said today. Uh, what do you feel? Let me unmute myself. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Well, what I think is that uh, definitely this uh, collaboration uh, was positive. It produced uh, um, innovative uh, results. And uh, I, my, my personal opinion is that uh, the benefit we got was the innovation. Uh, it, it promoted the innovation in the area. Now, when I see that uh, double cropping is a possible way of uh, increasing uh, biomass available for energy and for bioeconomy in general, uh, we are struggling now with this target of 35 uh, billion cubic meters per year to 2030 of biomethane from sustainable uh, resources. And, uh, one way, okay, is to increase the waste, the resources, but one way is also to have double cropping, sequential cropping, cover cropping, the immediate uh, cropping, all these uh, this ways. So definitely we have a reply already on this innovative part from uh, this uh, collaborative uh, research between uh, Be Cool and uh, BioValue. Um, as I said uh, in my presentation, uh, it is important that we continue this uh, type of uh, collaborations uh, globally, and that's why and we support that. That's why we have under mission innovation uh, a dedicated mission on integrated uh, bio refineries, uh, just because there is a, a lot of uh, fossil carbon that needs to be replaced uh, by uh, biocarbon, uh, either in fuels or in chemicals or in materials. And uh, I don't think uh, it is only a matter of uh, um, uh, only energy security or only climate. It is uh, both and it is everything. And uh, together, um, as I said, the, 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 the winner is the innovation. And through the innovation, you create growth. And through the growth, uh, you create prosperity. So uh, all these uh, are um, uh, tied together. And uh, one benefits uh, the other. So we, we would have uh, short-term solutions for uh, energy security and perhaps climate and mid-term, long-term uh, solutions for the climate neutrality, for the um, uh, growth, uh, the economic growth and the competitiveness of the economies and global challenges that uh, can be dealt only with uh, global collaborations to end with this. Thank you very much, Maria, for these kind words. Uh, and Ilka, what do you what do you can say us? What can Part I of say? your life was also dedicated to be cool project, no? <clears throat> well, um, if this is going to be kind of everything tied together uh, from my part, I, I mean, um, I fully agree with you that the world has changed a lot since the starting of the project. Um, and if anything, I don't, I don't think it undermines the decarbonate, uh, decarbonization part or the part of renewables or their role in any way. If it does anything, it just emphasizes them. Everything now has to happen more quickly. Um, and then there are these energy security component that this has emerged as an additional driver. I think this is an issue. Uh, that has been discussed already previously, but has not had a lot of visibility. The fact that renewables, especially wind and solar, being um, variable has always been uh, seen as a problem for energy security, for su security of supply, uh, not being a base load generation. The other side of the coin has always been that However, they are domestic. There is no valve that somebody can open or close for wind and solar around uh, from a different country like you can for gas. 
So this kind of other side of the coin of the energy security of, of renewables is, I think, now much more visible. Uh, what it means for bioenergy, I think, first thing to recognize, and here I echo our director, Keisuke Sadamori's, I think, intervention in the, in the opening um, um, event of, of the conference is that it's important to recognize that bioenergy already makes an important contribution to the kind of resilience and security of our energy systems. And we would be much more difficult situation if we wouldn't have bioenergy at the moment. So it, it's, uh, it, it provides resilience, it uh, provides security of supply, and in the margin, it kind of inhibits the, the um, need to uh, kind of, um, to, of price hikes. And in Europe, bioenergy still is 60% of renewable energy. Um, and uh, thinking now, I think the need is how can we increase quickly? I think bioenergy can and, and must uh, increase, but also can and must be done in a sustainable way. And I, I think this is a, um, a kind of the, the starting point that everything happens needs to be kind of sustainable and we need to have more uh, common view with different actors and stakeholders in the bioenergy community, proponents and people who are against, but what are the ground basic issues of sustainability we may most that we can agree on. So, but like, uh, and, and regarding the Be Cool project, I think I said in my own short intervention today that uh, two things that underpin the net zero emission scenario are are uh, innovation, uh, unlocking the new generation of low carbon technologies. We need to focus on that during this decade because they are really needed in the 30s and the 40s if we are going to have a reasonable chance of reaching our ambitious goals. And secondly, it needs to be done in a much deeper uh, uh, international collaboration that we are doing now because uh, it's also about the security of the transition more actors, more regions involved, uh, more uh, diverse supply chains, all make them more secure, more resilient, and, and, uh, and increase the likelihood of uh, achieving our goals. Now, these are kind of some of the things I, I have in mind at the moment. Thank you very much, Aika. Um, and also for your good presentation. I think it's a time of uh, uh, closing. Uh, so what to say at the end of this day, uh, uh, better to say at the end of these five years of Picula, I really feel uh, to say that this collaboration between the two projects uh, was great. Uh, despite an, a number of unfavorable circumstances, I could mention three or four major issues we had we, we all know the story of this uh, project, but let's think only to the pandemic, uh, the long lockdown periods in Europe, uh, in, uh, in Brazil as well. Uh, but as I said before, we definitely did not spare ourselves, right? So we, the results, in my opinion, are uh, solid, uh, very promising. Uh, likely inspiring for new project, I, I, I hope. Uh, not least the project gave the opportunity to establish a group and um, uh, I would say solid group, uh, including not only the European partners, but uh, Brazilian scientists. So it's uh, an international uh, group. Uh, this is my opinion, much more than uh, a simple deliverable of the project of because maybe not that obvious today, but uh, I strongly believe that this will be this will bring fruits in the in the in the near future, in the next years. So thank you very much to all of you, to all the speakers, uh, uh, to the panelists for this and the nice presentation, a very inspired uh, debate. And now I give the floor to Mauricio um, for the for the closure of the meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Thanks to all the speakers and the attendees. Uh, it was really, really very motivating and stimulating working in this project. Uh, I'd like to thank you all again and just remind that uh, the final, the, the project will end this month uh, 
and we will continue with the dissemination activities of the final results beyond this event uh, in the coming weeks uh, and months. So stay tuned. Thanks again for staying this long and uh, I wish you uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.